like I'm hoping that someone else is gonna see this, nothing. I'm like, you know, I'm like letting people know. I jump out of the bushes with this knife in my hand and I jump after these guys. They freak out because a bush just jumps out at them, right? And they turn and start running. But then I realize as I'm chasing them, I don't have a gun on me, right? I have a knife. I've literally taken a knife to a gunfight. My name is Chief Warrant Officer 3, Gunner A.J. Pichuti. I served in the Marine Corps from July 7th, 2002 to August 1st, 2023. So I was born and raised in San Jose, California. My father was an immigrant uh, to this country. He's an Italian immigrant, was a truck driver and a teamster through most of his life. Uh, and then my mother uh, was from uh, San Francisco area uh, and met my dad um, when she was studying abroad. So my mother was an artist. My father was a truck driver. Um, they split up when I was relatively young, which really worked out because I had such a diverse family. So my mother married uh, an Argentinian man and his entire family were Argentinian immigrants. And then my father uh, you know, married another woman, which had another very eclectic family. And so I actually was very fortunate and the fact that I didn't have one mother and one father. I had effectively four parents and then a very, very uh, dynamic uh, upbringing. When my father raised me and my mom raised me, a very typical immigrant story is my father raised me to be an American boy. So when he was a truck driver, he was a long haul truck driver. He was the quintessential like 1980s, 1990s truck driver and also as an immigrant, right? So he would wear, I think like Roadhouse, right? So like a flannel shirt, real tight jeans, belt buckle, points, right? You know, cowboy boots and square dancing, right? Like that was his thing. A lot of the typical immigrant story is a lot of them leave their culture behind and adapt an American culture. And so he raised me to do that. So I joined the Boy Scouts very early on. My mom was my Wee Below's den leader. Uh, and I played baseball versus, you know, soccer. Um, and I didn't learn Italian. So it was very much like an American-centric kind of upbringing. So I was in Boy Scouts uh, all the way through high school. I attained my Eagle Scout at 16 years old. When I was 17, I was a senior in high school. And I remember waking up uh, in the morning going to school and on September 11th and then the first tower had been struck and by the time I had gotten to school the second tower had been struck and I remember going into school and they had kind of stopped all classes and we were in the auditorium uh, and most of the students were in the auditorium watching a you know a live feed of everything as it kind of went down and I remember sitting as a group watching the towers fall and uh, the kind of awe and the silence kind of sucked the energy out of the room watching this. And I was compelled um, that I felt that our democracy and way of life was under attack. I immediately met with a Marine Corps recruiter and three weeks later I, I, I joined the delayed entry program and, um, and then had to wait to graduate high school to ship to boot camp. When I went to my recruiting office, I originally signed up as a reservist air delivery specialist. Right after 9-11, um, I was a senior in high school and I watched the Twin Towers fall um, and immediately signed up to join the Marines. And the job that I kind of went into was as a reserve. I went to the delayed entry program and joined that, that process uh, and ended up as a reservist air delivery specialist. When I looked around and started talking to my recruiters before I shipped to boot camp, I realized that pretty much everyone in my recruiting office was an infantry Marine. I had one reconnaissance Marine, uh, one motor uh, transport Marine, and then the rest were grunts. And so I started talking to them. I didn't know much about the service before joining. I just wanted to serve my country. Not everybody's an infant. What is infantry, right? Not everyone's that. And they're like, oh no, you got to sign up for that. So I went to my uh, recruiter and I uh, informed him that I wanted to both change my MOS and go active duty. So I had to do the MEPS process all over again, uh, which frustrated my recruiter, but eventually I, I joined the Marine Corps as an O3XX, uh, was an infantry contract. I mean, obviously it's a culture shock, right? So here I am some like surfer kid from like Northern California, right? Which is, I had really no other military in my family, so I didn't really know what to expect. I mean, my parents had to sign the permission slip for me to join the Marine Corps. So I showed up to boot camp at 17. I mean, I had hair down to here uh, kind of thing. And so getting into boot camp, it was an absolute culture shock, uh, but it was something that I really, really wanted. Part of my story is, is self-doubt. So 
as a young, you know, adolescent kid, right, you know, growing up, a lot of us are plagued with self-doubt. And I was one of those kids as well. And I would always remember thinking about how whatever the goal that I wanted to attain, I lacked the physical skills or the mental skills, the requirements to be able to do that. And so I would often set the thing aside saying, well, no, I could never actually attain that. Boot camp was the first opportunity to to prove to myself that I was worthy, that I was valuable, that I could join something greater than myself and kind of prove to myself that I was worthy of being a Marine. I was a part of an interesting kind of crowd within boot camp. Like I was, I graduated boot camp as a squad leader. Um, and so I was meritoriously promoted to private first class. I was like this really annoying, like the annoying kid in boot camp who's like wants to be a leader, right? Like it was, I, I really wanted to do do it really well. I didn't want to be the gray man. I really wanted to work as hard as possible. Again, wanted to really prove to myself that I, that I could do it. Uh, so I eventually attained the rank of uh, a private first class and squad leader when I graduated. When you go through boot camp, you hear about the fleet. All you hear about is the fleet, the fleet, the fleet. So it starts to become this like really nebulous, kind of like pie in the sky, scary thing, right? It's like something you don't understand. And then I went through school of infantry uh, for three months. And the school of infantry at the time was not good, right? It was, it was not a good place. It was the culture that we promoted as a service inside of the school of infantry was that we weren't valuable, that we were effectively a number, that our lives didn't matter. So why would they spend time training us, right? So it was very much like moving cattle from one place to the other. But they always talked about the fleet. And it was always with this like, wait till you get to the fleet, you know, you're gonna get it kind of thing. And so yeah, I was petrified showing up to the fleet. And then add on to the fact that I was the first class in boot camp to get issued the new digital camis, right? So we all know the term colloquially in the Marine Corps boot, right? So not only did I show up to the fleet as a new guy, I was very easily identifiable. So everybody else had, you know, the tricolor, you know, uh, you know, woodlands, right? And I'm showing up digis, right? And so that was terrible. I also was really good at taking tests in School of Infantry. So I graduated as the honor graduate from the School of Infantry and was promoted to Lance Corporal, a fate worse than death in the infantry when you're joining a new unit. I'm 18 at this point, brand new 18. I'm wearing digital camis and I'm a Lance Corporal. It was not a good welcoming into the fleet. So we have the term, you know, senior Lance Corporal, the guy who's been there for a while. It's like, welcome to the fleet, you know, <laughs> right kind of thing. There wasn't a very warm welcome, but the difference was that there was this thing that was brewing. So we joined and Marines had already deployed to Afghanistan off of, I believe it was like the 15th Mew, if I'm not mistaken. The, the clouds of war were starting to form and Iraq and the sentiment behind Iraq was starting to form. So we all believed that we were going to Iraq. That was kind of the national understanding. It was very much like, we're gonna start training as fast as possible to get you ready. Ultimately what happened was I was, I got to the fleet December 20th of 20, oh, sorry, 2002. And I deployed to Kuwait uh, on like February 11th, 2003. Like nobody even knew my name. And the culture around new guys in the fleet was not good, right? It was, again, it was the same thing that was perpetuated from the School of Infantry was that I was valueless, that uh, I didn't matter, my name wasn't worth knowing. It was very kind of weird. And that was as a whole. There were some exceptions to that. And there were some specific exceptions of the people that were my direct superiors, right? My team leader uh, took, you know, great care of me and like took me under his wing. Third Battalion, Fifth Marines was the first unit that I joined out of Camp Pendleton. And it was first platoon, India Company, uh, and then first squad, first fire team. So uh, Corporal Eric Olson was the uh, fire team leader. He had done a deployment, right? Which to me was like, you know, like you're like this God, right? And Eric Olson was a very fair leader and he took care of me. And the thing that he showed me that resonated for the remainder of my career was that when the entire culture was based off of something that is, you're not good enough, Corporal Olson, right, Corporal Duncan, Sergeant Pryor, my squad leader, they showed me empathy. They showed me that I was, at least even as a boot, that I had some value. They got to know my name, who I was, and I remembered that. Whenever I look back to those individuals, I think of how they made me feel. I was petrified. I was 18 years old, deploying to Kuwait to go to 
you know, Iraq. We all thought we were going to die, right? All this kind of stuff. And I'm nervous beyond belief. And I have these three men that were nice to me and they believed me and they took me under their wing. And so it's one of those things that stayed with me for the remainder of my career. Three Five had just had a really big hazing allegation like right before I got there. And so they were pretty, you know, timid as far as any of that kind of stuff goes. That stuff happened later in Iraq after after time because everyone was really focused on going to, to, to the war. Now there was like staying in the barracks and people getting like, again, the culture wasn't very good writ large for, you know, new Marines coming into the fleet. I befriended a guy very, very early on. His name was Charlie Graham. And Charlie Graham got to the fleet one week before me. He was from Tampa, Florida. And he got to the fleet one week before me. And to me, having one week of experience in the fleet when I'm a brand new guy, is like, oh, right, you know, like, tell me. And he had the tricolor camis. So like he super blended in. So he was like a totally different person, right? So we kind of stuck together as far as, you know, companionship. I'm a Lance Corporal, right? You don't know much, right? Uh, unskilled and unaware kind of thing, right? I don't know what I don't know. All I know is I got on a bus, right, and showed up in Kuwait and didn't have, you know, we ate sausages and rice or whatever it was. And then I remember going out to, we had to go like dig fighting positions. And we were like at the edge of Kuwait looking into Iraq, which is like one line of desert to the next line of desert. It was like in, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't differentiate. And we like dug these fighting holes and then sat in these fighting holes for like weeks on end. And then we would get rotations back and forth to Camp Coyote is where we were at. I remember just kind of sitting there and just being hungry and just staring at, you know, we've been combing the desert for hours kind of thing. Like we're staring out into nothing. Uh, and then practicing gas drills all the time. Every day we would have some sort of, you know, gas, gas, gas. And you're like, you're getting into your mop suit, putting your gas mask on. And then you're like, and then you sit, you know, for four more hours, you know, and sipping your canteen out of your gas mask and really going over the war plans. We were not as organized as we tend to broadcast. I mean, I remember seeing the trucks pulling up with all the body bags that they had prepared for us. And you're like, that's not, you know, like, maybe don't show me where I'm going to end up kind of thing. Going over clearing trenches and we're doing what limited war plans and our platoon sergeants keeping us engaged, you know, as much as possible. But yeah, it was a lot of like not knowing what was going on, just basically becoming comfortable with not really knowing anything. And then we crossed the line of departure, right? Then it was uh, March 20th, it was the official start of the invasion into Iraq. We're in the tracks, right? So we're all mounted up. And I remember first recon is forward of the berm and they, you know, help set explosives for the berm. Like there was a berm that separated Iraq and Kuwait. And so it was like first tanks was going through, first recon was already across the border. I don't really know what recon is at this point. I just know they're like way cool, right? Doing a whole bunch of cool stuff. They blow the berm, the tanks go through, and then and then here comes 1st Marine Division. And we're like driving through this like gap in the lines. And the first place we're going is the Ramoya oil fields. And I remember it's the middle of the night, right? And so whenever you're on a track, you have most of the people sitting inside the track, and then you have air sentry. And air sentry always goes to the lowest form of human existence, which is the brand new guy. And so everyone else is like in some form of falling asleep or, you know, whatever, nerves, whatever. And there's myself and Charlie Graham, right, up on air security, right? And so we're standing on this little bench, and that's where we spent most of the war. But one of the most poignant stories was I remember crossing the line of departure. Here I am. I'm like trained for it. I was a squad leader in boot camp. I was the honor graduate out of School of Infantry. I'm a boot in 3-5 and we're conditioned three, right? In our So we have a magazine inserted and I've, I have an M16A2 that's older than me with an M203 grenade launcher. And so I've got like the grenade thing and I like weigh a million pounds and I'm like a, a boy with a gun. The direction is that as soon as we cross the line of departure, you're supposed to go to condition one. Anyone that's been in the service long enough understands that all you do is like your magazine's inserted and now you just rack the bolt to the rear and then the bolt slides home and then closes on your chamber and now you have a ready to go gun. So here's what happens. I rack the bolt to the rear. I hear the worst sound in the world where effectively I let go of the charging handle and the bolt slides hits the bullet in the magazine and then doesn't go forward, doesn't recede all the way. 
And then I don't know what to do. And I panic, right? And so I look over to Charlie, right, who is the saw gunner, because that's what boots do in the infantry is they carry the saw. And I look at him and I go, again, middle of the night, we have our seven bravos, you know, so we're trying to do all this stuff. And I'm like, what do I do? And he goes, well, I don't know, I don't know man, right? And so like, him and I are trying to like MacGyver this thing. And I, because the culture that was established at the time frame in the Marine Corps was the culture was a culture of fear, right? Of never wanting to screw up because of fear of retribution, of getting hit, getting hurt, getting berated, whatever it is. Here's how I got my first combat action ribbon, right? So this is what everyone's like, oh, combat action ribbon, you're a total badass, this stuff. Here's how I got it. I drove across the line of departure with a condition three and a half gun, right? Because the only thing that I like knew how to do was look around and go, and then I closed my ejection port cover. Now, my team leader was, was I didn't want to wake him up, right? But the other people that were awake, I looked down and surveyed the group of people that were awake that I could ask for help. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to show them that I don't know what I'm doing. And I don't want the backlash from this, whatever this is. So I was like, I'd rather take, you know, the unknown in Iraq than the known of getting berated and beat up for being a stupid boot, right? So I just closed my ejection port cover. It, thankfully, nothing happened that first night, right? So we drive across the border, you know, we're seeing artillery shells and all kinds of things happening, and I have a gun that doesn't work. So that's how I got my first combat action ribbon. And I would tell people this story a lot through the service when I was in the Marines to tell them that, like, listen, it's a piece of ribbon. People get it for a number of different reasons. Now, again, this is the day one. A lot more stuff happened along the way, but afterwards what charlie and i did was the first night we stop after like pushing for whatever and then what you're required to do as a boot is the first thing you do is dig your fire team leader's fighting hole and then you dig your fighting hole right so i had to dig someone else's fighting hole right because i'm the boot so we did that and then everyone's starting to like go down to sleep and then charlie and i go around the back of the track and then we're like trying to figure out how to not make my gun explode because we literally don't know what to do at this point. I mean, I know now how to solve the problem. I know it's just out of battery and all I have to do is re-rack the bolt and send it forward. But at the time I was so scared, I just didn't know what to do. So we we're like taking this thing apart, like looking, looking around, making sure senior doesn't see us, you know, as we're taking our gun <laughs> apart, you know? So one of the funnier stories from that. Uh, so we secured the Ramoyo oil fields on the first couple of days, right? I had a gun that worked at that point, finally. And so you have the droves of people surrendering, right? So we're handling those surrenders kind of stuff. Then we move up, eventually we go and we're, it's weird. Like we're basically just on this highway and we're like, here we go, highway to Baghdad, right? And Charlie and I are on perpetual air sentry. So like the exhaust from the track is coming out. So half his face and my face are black. We have our little dumb goggles and, you know, and we're like just looking out of the desert forever. And then we get to this place, which ends up being a Republican guard training facility. And that was like a real fight. So we pull up and there's gunfight on the right of the road. There's gunfights on the left of the road. And then we get out and we hear the, you know, the, the, the click, click, click from the track opening the doors. And we go out, we do our thing. We're like, Rah! And there's like, and then it's like chaos, right? It's all hell's breaking loose. We are in the middle of a, of a training camp effectively for a Republican Guard, and they're fighting furiously uh, as we get out. And so we get online, we cross a wadi, and then we uh, just start doing what Marines do is I find Corporal Olson, I find Sergeant Pryor, my squad leader, and then we just start moving, you know, kind of forward. Charlie Graham will never forgive me for telling the story, but I remember there was a moment where him and I had kind of gotten separated from the group. And so we are sitting there and there is a, you know, an, a PKM or an RPK, right? So an enemy machine gun has basically us pinned. So we're like laying behind this berm and this PKM is just lighting us up. They have a bead on us. And every time we put our head up, it's like pow, 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 pow. And we're like, <laughs> I'm 18, he's 19. We don't know what the hell is going on. It's our first gunfight, right? And we look at each other like, what are we going to do? And he says to me, he goes, I, I don't know, man, but I, I have to take a piss. And I was like, what, right? So what he does, we're literally getting fired at. And what he does is he like leans over and like starts peeing, right? And we're laughing at each other because I was like, I'm never gonna forgive you for this, right? You know, like this is his response. I, I joke about it, right? His response is like a, a desert tortoise in 29 Palms, right? So your self-defense mechanism is to piss yourself. Like that's what it is, right? He has gone on to a very illustrious career in the Marine Corps and has very much <laughs> redeemed himself. But so we're getting shot at. And, and I remember sitting there completely petrified because we don't know what's happening. I've like separated from my team leader at this point. 
And then all of a sudden, what we do is we see a Cobra. So Cobras, again, the OAF-1 was very different. Instead of like a normal conflict where you have, it's almost like an orchestra and there's kind of a, a pattern to things, I would compare OAF-1 to like jazz. It was like a free flowing, right? And so we're in this gunfight and we're trying to shoot this PKM. Other people are trying to shoot as well. And here comes this Cobra, like out of nowhere, right? So this guy comes over and I swear this story is true. Like it sounds out of this world, right? So this Cobra comes over, I'm scared out of my mind. We're like yelling, we're like, ah, we're like pointing, like, hey, over here. And so he looks over and we watch it because it's attached to his helmet, right? So he looks at it and then he just starts ripping this chain gun at this PKM. And then he starts shooting Zuni rockets and he's right above us, right? And so just like the movie Black Hawk Down where like the casings are falling, everyone's like, ching, 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 like casings are falling all over. So this guy, he's like wrecking into this thing and like ripping this thing up, hand to God. He then turns the helicopter and tilts it like this, salutes, and then takes off. And we're like, ah, you know, we're like, wow. that is amazing, you know? And then we like proceed to push. So this guy like totally whacks this machine gun thing that has this pin, and then the fight is on. Now, first platoon is moving. And so we're fighting this way, and then first platoon starts to do, I think we called it hammerhead left, I think. And so we basically start closing the door. And so we start moving this way and then we're closing the door. And then, then once we close the door this way, then we squeegee kind of this direction. And we're shooting everything. It's like a huge gunfight. There's like people everywhere. Corporal Olson and myself have 203s, uh, uh, the grenade launcher on our M16s. And we have some guys pretty far out and we're able to within, you know, effective range of us. And so I'm a pretty good, pretty good at math. And so was uh, Corporal Olson. And he taught me how to use the M203 really well. And so him and I just laid there and just like worked on these guys that were like fighting towards us and then eventually changed their mind after a first couple of them got blown up, right? I remember we continued the squeegee even more. And then I was uh, adjoined with uh, Sergeant uh, Nick Galvan was another squad leader. So we got with them. I watched uh, Joseph uh, Perez run through. I watched him pick up an AT-4, shoot an AT-4 at a machine gun bunker, take the machine gun bunker out, and then get shot, subsequently winning the Navy Cross in this whole thing. And I'm like, this is happening. Like you're, you feel like you're in a total movie when this stuff. So I watch him, you know, he gets shot and falls down. And then this, you know, third squad's over there, like laying, helping him out and everything. And then eventually we, you know, as the sun is setting, we're able to come back to the tracks. That was called uh, for 3-5, or any company specifically, that was called the Killing Fields, as, as it was, uh, you know, the Republican Guard area, and we had just kind of gone through and, and cleared them all out. The thing that I remember the most from that was by that time, it was, I think it may have been like April 4th, I think if the time frame is correct. So we're at, at it for two weeks at this point. We hadn't showered. We had, were running out of socks. I remember the thing that we got from uh, the packs of the Republican Guard was their socks. They had new socks. I remember that. And so we took those. We didn't like pillage anything else. It was like they had rice and socks. And so that was what I remember taking from them. So I got a brand new pair of socks at the end of that day. I didn't feel much because sun was setting, which meant I had to dig a fighting hole. Uh, so multiple fighting holes. And then I remember sitting there with Charlie that night, you know, we we're just talking about, you know, the day and what was going on. And it was like, you know, but we're all kind of in it, you know, and Charlie was always much stronger than I was. Like he was, he was a much better Marine than I've ever been. Right. He was just, he was. He was a, you know, he was a PFC at the time, right? And I was a Lance Corporal, didn't matter, right? But he had, he and I had bonded pretty early on in that time frame, And so he helped keep everything cool. And I remember talking to Sergeant Galvan, who was, I believe, third squad, third squad leader uh, of where the Navy Cross had happened. And like, they were, the, they had, they had moved, they had medevaced the Marine already and he's stable and everything like that. So it was fantastic, you know, in that, in that regard. And then I just remember getting eaten alive by mosquitoes. Well, eventually we moved into a place called uh, Adiwania, um, and then we moved into Diwania, and that was the a very interesting time for us was getting into, you know, going into Bag Baghdad, going into Diwania, and then stabilizing the country as fast as possible because their currency had devalued because of the bank system shutting down. It was a lot of stability type stuff that was very new for us. It was what the Marine Corps and what historians would eventually call the awakening was that time frame. We ended up redeploying back to Camp Pendleton in September of 2003, I think it was. Uh, and then right after that, it was where the insurgency had kind of began. And so the war had changed dramatically from OIF-1 to eventually what would become OIF-2. Another fate worse than death for an infantry Marine was 
I was at the very tail end of OIF-1, I was targeted by my first sergeant in company, Gunny, because they found out that I was from Silicon Valley. And so because they thought I was, well, they knew I was from Silicon Valley, they assumed I was really good at typing. And so what they did was they pulled me out of first platoon at the very end of the deployment and brought me into H&S and made me the company clerk for India Company. <laughs> And it was like, I had just become a fire team leader, right? And then all of a sudden I go to the company office and I'm a company clerk and I fought and kicked and screamed. And then it was like, so I felt like it was like every, like, oh yeah, I'm total badass. And then ripped away as I was the company clerk. And it was like a super degrading, demoralizing experience for that. Being a company clerk is what led me to taking the leap to become a sniper and, and take a sniper in dock at the time. You know, a lot of the stories you hear from infantry Marines is they wanted to become snipers, but they had just become a team leader or just become a squad leader. And so that didn't have, you know, the appeal that it did. I was an uh, India company clerk. And so I was like hating my life. And so I was like, yeah, the sniper thing sounds fantastic. Let's do that. The original inception of the idea of becoming a sniper, I will always default back to self-doubt and self-image, is in my recruiting office, I had a reconnaissance Marine who was a recruiter and he was a sniper. And I remember when I was changing my MOS from reservist air delivery specialist to infantry, we talked about all things infantry. He brought in his ghillie suit, he showed me pictures of him jumping, and I was like, yeah, champs, no way. Like, that's neat, but there's no way that I can do that. Like, it's way too... So self-doubt just kind of, you know, crept in and prevented me from ever thinking that that was possible. So as the company clerk for India Company, I, I had become very close with the gunnery sergeant. Uh, the gunnery sergeant's name was Ricky Jackson, and he was from the Deep South. He called me Pea Shoot, right? Uh, and so that was how he pronounced my name. So he was very nice to me. Again, empathy, right? Understanding the, the, the things that helped me along my career, uh, the trajectory along my career, I've recognized were people that saw something in me that I couldn't see in myself. And so Gunny Jackson saw that and we talked about it. He mentored me. What do you want to do, Pea Shoot? Do you want to stay in? You want to get out? I'm like, I want to be a sniper, gunnery sergeant. And he was like, all right. And so he was like this fitness guru. I mean, he was just like built like a brick shit house, right? No neck, just traps kind of thing. And he was like, all right, I'm gonna get you ready. So for six months at, when we were back in Camp Pendleton, Gunny Jackson thrashed me. I mean, not like hazed me, but he got me ready. His wife was also a Marine. So I remember them driving me over to Mainside, we like run the track together. And he was running with the sprints. He was. I, I didn't know any of this stuff, right? I was cut for my high school baseball team because I wasn't good enough, right? So I like grew up playing baseball, but I wasn't like a, I wasn't like a, you know, the traditional like football athlete, you know, coming in or a baseball, you know? So I didn't know about nutrition and stuff like that. So he taught me all those things. And then comes the day. So the sniper end off is February 4th, 2004. And I have it on the calendar. It's like, you know, have one deployment, no NJPs, whatever the thing is. And I'm going down the list. I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm like, good. And then comes time for Lance Corporal Prosciutti to request permission to my first sergeant to go take the sniper in duck. And I remember this vividly because sometimes you learn lessons from good leaders. Sometimes you learn better lessons from bad leaders. Gunny Jackson had worked with me for six months to prepare me for this opportunity to change the trajectory of my life. And he believed in me. And so then I started to believe in myself. And so then I had to report into my first sergeant. And Gunny Jackson already briefed him, already prepped him on the whole thing, right? And so I go in there, you know, he made me bang on the hatch, right? You know, it was like very, like now that I look back on it, when, after I've retired from 21 years, I'm like, God, you know, like the things that I had to do as a young man, right? Or a young Marine that were like super subservient. I just, I, I just didn't make other people do that to me. Like it was the positions of power kind of stuff. Bang on the hatch. He's like, what is it? Come in here. And I had to like report in six and center and I'm position of attention, which I know now isn't the thing, whatever, you know? And so... You know, Lance Corporal Prosciutti requests permission to take the sniper in dock on Monday. The sniper platoon at the time, we called stay platoon, right? Surveillance and target acquisition. And he says, I have your stay platoon right here. I'm going to cuss for a second, right? And I said, I have your stay platoon right here. You're staying the fuck here, Prosciutti. Get out of my office. I roger that for sergeant, right? And so I have to like come to position of attention and I walk out and Gunny Jackson's in there with the first sergeant. And you can hear them talking and kind of getting in an argument. And then it's like a Friday, right? So it's the Friday before the sniper end on. And uh, everybody leaves and I'm heartbroken. I've been preparing for this for six months, Gunny Jackson working. And again, I wasn't like a peak athlete at this point. Like I was 19, right, at this point. So I you know, had a, maybe a little bit more muscle on my body. 
And I remember sitting there, and this is the first time in my life that Gunny Jackson affected the trajectory of my entire life. He sat there while I'm like, I'm a, basically a kid, right? I'm 19 years old. I have my combat action ribbon from my own one, right? And he says, and he looks at me and he says, pea shoot. And he says, every man is in charge of his own destiny. If you're not here on Monday morning, I'll know where you're at. And he left it to me. And so here I was as a 19 year old Lance Corporal who's like petrified of anybody else that's not a Lance Corporal, right? Because that's what the system inculcates, says, follow your dreams and disobey a direct order from a first sergeant, which is like the worst thing you can do, or don't follow your dreams, capitulate and come to work as a company clerk on Monday morning. So I had a choice. So Monday morning, I showed up to the sniper in doc and I worked my way through it poorly as I did through that because it's, so the sniper indocs, now they're called screenings, right? Uh, the sniper indocs are very physically based, right? They want to like root people out, you know, so you run two PFTs back to back and then you get in the pool and you do all these like mental games along the way to try to be like, you know what? I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. Well, here's the thing. I was the runt of the litter and I will admit to everybody, I was the least physical specimen there was. I was struggling through everything. I didn't score well on the second PFT in a row, but I just didn't quit. And then I remember being in the pool and I was not like the best swimmer in the world, I could swim. And I remember sitting in the pool and here's the second place that Gunny Jackson affected the trajectory of my life. We're in the pool and it's meant to stress people out, right? And I'm stressing out and I'm like, nope, no, nope, I'm done. I'm done, I can't do this. And I start swimming to the side of the pool. And I swim to the side of the pool because I'm quitting. I'm literally quitting the sniper in dock. It wasn't for me, it was too tough. And I go to the side of the pool and I see two boots. And then I look up and is the largest, scariest black man I've ever seen in my entire life, Gunny Jackson. And he goes, what are you doing, Pashuti? And I went, I'm, I'm just too hard. And he says, get back in the swim, you know, swim back to the middle. And in that moment of weakness, I was, I was giving up. And then I saw the person who had invested time into me and it became about him. So I swam my skinny little ass right back in the middle of the pool and survived. Again, I was not good, right? But I survived. And the sniper in doc takes about a week. And so you go through this whole thing where that was just Monday morning at 6 a.m. By that time, I was like gassed. And then you go and you run missions and you're, we, they ask us to show up with a protractor, a map and a compass. I don't know what a protractor is. So on Sunday night, I go to Office Depot and I buy a literal protractor, like a protractor for graphs and scales, not like a protractor for reading maps. And so I pull this, remember, I was also the honor graduate out of School of Infantry. So I pull this protractor out and all the snipers start laughing at me because I have like an actual protractor, right? You know, and not like the one that we use for reading maps. Didn't know how to read a map, none of this stuff. And so they showed me, gave me the fundamentals. And then I went and like failed every land navigation thing. Like, I did not do well right through this thing. But the idea wasn't to, to ace the exam. The idea was to find out who had the kind of grit. And that's kind of the subplot of a lot of this stuff. I don't know what it was. Uh, by the end of the week, uh, there was a lot less people there. There was probably six or seven people left uh, out of the 50 you know, people that started. Um, and the sniper platoon decided to bring me into the platoon on a probationary period because I sucked. Like I was not good. So I became a pig in the sniper platoon in February of 2004. And then we started all this training and that was simultaneous to all of the uprising of the awakening of the insurgency inside of Iraq. And so that turned us to preparing for what would ultimately be Fallujah and the invasion of Fallujah in November of 2004. You know, through your life, you have to be able to learn how to forgive people that have wronged you, right, uh, along the way. Um, I never understood why he was the way that he was. Um, he came to the pool too, and he tried to get me to come out of the pool and pull me out because I was disobeying a direct order. Um, Gunny Jackson was there and he stopped it. Again, that was the first and second time he affected the trajectory of my life. There is more. This man and I have crossed paths so many times that what I try to, and I know this is kind of like the end of the story kind of thing, is that what I have found through my career is that I don't believe in a self-made man or a self-made woman. I believe in the fact that there is a community that makes people better. And so the idea is that Gunny Jackson was the first and along, well, actually Corporal Olson, right, was the first in the long line of people that saw something in me that I couldn't see in myself. 
and then provided me the opportunity to be able to become better than I could ever imagine. And so that became the theme of my career. I was the run, and I cannot express this enough, right? And people will comment and say whatever they want about how shitty I was. I was. I was not a good pig. I was not physically strong. I just lacked that. That just wasn't my prowess. I was very, very smart, um, but I just wasn't very strong or very fast, whatever the, you know, the thing was. I got better over time, right? And, you know, through, you know, through encouragement, through mentorship and through training, I got better. But yeah, it was, it was a struggle. I mean, as a matter of fact, I got kicked out of the sniper platoon. In August timeframe uh, of 2004, I got kicked out of the sniper platoon because I was, I was underperforming as a pig. I wasn't doing very good, but we had this thing that was, so I was out of the platoon. No, it might, it might've been June. So I did three months during the probationary period and then they kicked me out. And I was like the lowest of the low. Not only did I not go back to India company as the company clerk, even back to a line company, I went to h and company as the company clerk. So I didn't even go back to the infantry. I went to like h and company, company clerk. I was like mortified, right? But my saving grace was this, was that we had this thing called MSIDS, Maritime Secondary Imagery Dissemination System. It was our like cameras, our uh, you know reconnaissance cameras, our computers, and how we were able to send that information. Well, here's where the technical prowess helped. Being from Silicon Valley, be understanding computers, that was my way in. So I was kicked out of the platoon for a period of like mm, uh, two months almost. So from like June to, I don't, whatever the two months is after that, right? I was out. Well, as we're getting ready to ramp up to go back to Fallujah, they realize that nobody in the platoon can really manage the MSIDs because it's a lot of information, it's a lot of data. So I was brought back into the platoon to manage the MSIDs because I was an HNS. So I was given a second lease on life, right? And so, but you come back into the platoon after getting kicked out, you're like a pariah, right? You know, you're like, you know, this kind of, like we talked about earlier was like, who, who are you, right? You, did, you, didn't, you don't deserve to be here. So I had to fight through that kind of stuff and, and kind of earn my place back into it. So I fell into uh, the team from a gentleman by the name of Guillermo Sandoval. Guillermo Sandoval was another very compassionate man who really took care of me and helped train me and kind of teach me along the way. And then what happened is we go into Fallujah. So September 11th of 2004, we deployed back to Iraq. So literally like one year to the day from when I had left Iraq, we land back in Iraq for the second battle of Fallujah, Operation Al-Fajr. 2-1 and a number of units had already done like a push initially, but then they got called back because the United States like wasn't ready or something like that. And so we go back in and everybody knows this is the OK Corral, right? So I'm a pig in a sniper platoon. We're going back into Fallujah. I'm in team four. So what we did was we had team one, two, and three were all assigned to a individual company, you know, uh, India company, Lima company, and Kilo company, right? And then team four was assigned to h &S company or a general purpose. So we kind of go everywhere. And I was with Guillermo Sandoval. We are at a place called Camp Bahia. Everyone's getting ready to go. It's like November 8th is, I believe, when we started uh, Operation al Fajr in the very early morning. So November 7th, we're like, you know, playing music, smoking cigarettes, you know, loading all of our guns and get ready to go. Like, we know that this is going to be a fight. You bring your guns, we'll bring our guns. We're going to figure this thing out inside of Fallujah. And I am in a Humvee with Guillermo Sandoval, and we're just a two-man team. I'm the junior guy in the team, so... Naturally, I'm carrying the Sasser, which is, by definition, it's not technically a sniper rifle because it doesn't hold a minute of angle, but we call it a special application scoped rifle is what the Sasser is. And it's, so it's generally an anti-material application is what we use it for. It shoots a 50 caliber bullet, has a mean kick, but a bunch of springs inside of it, so it makes it you know, manageable. So I'm carrying the Sasser and a M16A4, and uh, Guillermo or Memo is carrying an M40 and then an M16 as well. And we're like working our way up. So we go to the place called the apartment buildings, which is the very north set, north side? Yeah, north side of the city. And we're making entry into the, so we pull this Humvee up there. The grunts are like moving through. Everything's got, we got it. The whole hell is breaking loose, right? And so we go up in this apartment building and we like open the door and then we just start getting shot at immediately. We have no idea for where from. So the apartment buildings are probably six stories and it's a big square kind of just what you would think of as like a, you know, projects kind of apartment building. And so we're going out on the side and then they start peppering the side of the building and Memo and I jump inside and then we start climbing to find a position inside of the building because now what the apartment buildings overlook this very large area of where the grunts have to cross to get into the 
first part of the city. So there was like a cemetery, there's like some fields. And so we need to provide overwatch for the infantry as they're pushing through. So Memo and I get up into a position. And then what we hear is a few, we're like, we find, we find a room that we're like, we're on, we're not on the very top floor. We're like one floor below and we're looking out over the city and we're like setting up. And then we hear a door open and then we hear footsteps charging up the hill or charging up the stairs. And we're like, here you go. The guys that just shot at us are the people that are coming up the stairs. So we come out, we're laying down, ready to go. Who comes up the stairs? A gentleman by the name of Chris Kyle and his spotter, two Navy SEALs, are running up the stairs and they come up and we're like, hey, we're Americans, we're Americans, right? So we stop the whole thing and then we're like, hey, what's up? So it's now it's Chris Kyle, who's a sniper spotter team with his, with his partner, and Memo and myself are the sniper spotter team for the Marines. Problem for Chris Kyle is that we have the better position inside the house, right? You know, finders keepers, right? So we get the better, and he's like trying to talk to us, like, hey, you always wanna share? And Memo's like, nope, <laughs> find your own spot, right? <laughs> <laughs> so what happens is Chris Kyle and his partner have to go literally across the hall from us. So, I mean, it is not a very big building. So we're in the what would be, I don't know, effectively like a two bedroom apartment. And then he's in like a very small one bedroom apartment. And we are within 30 feet of each other. And so for the rest, they set up their position overlooking the city. We set up ours. We ha They have a Winchester, 300 Win Mag, a Winchester Magnum. We have the M40 and then the SAS are set up in two adjacent rooms. And then we're covering the city, right? And so what happens is as we go through this process, bad guys start doing bad things and we're able to kind of work on them. And so what happened is we started actually, this sounds kind of morbid, but you know, snipers, it's kind of a, uh, uh, you know, a thing that they do is we would shoot somebody, right? And then we would be like, Marines won, right? And then Chris Kyle and his partner would be like, Navy won, right? And so we started having this like, cause there was a lot of bad dudes cruising around. And so we had this kind of like competition where we're yelling back and forth to one another about shooting across this field like into the open area of the city and uh, i won't tell you who won that day but you know uh there is uh, uh you know you can read that in a, in a different book that, that was written by another marine sniper uh but yeah uh, you know the marines came out pretty pretty far ahead and so that was the very first day of fallujah for us and which was much different than the first day of fallujah for the line companies themselves that was a fist fight for those guys and so we stayed in that position for probably three days as we were in that position. In the very beginning was very, very good, but then became agonizing because I was able to track on my map where the infantry was moving as they were pushing through the city. Three, one, three, five, I think it was one, three. Uh, and then there was an army unit and I'm tracking casualties. I'm hearing everything on the chatter go on. And now we're not part of it because we're holding to the North and we haven't gotten a new set of mission or, or orders yet. So a lot of stuff kind of goes on. And then on a very, very bad night for 3-5, our call sign for the sniper platoon was Banshee. And so Banshee 2, who was with India Company, got in, uh, the Ban uh, India Company got in a hellacious firefight. And a gentleman by the name of Doc Pell, HM3 Pell, was a sniper platoon corpsman, was crossing between two buildings and was struck with uh, machine gun fire. And he eventually survived, but you know, he had gotten kind of zippered up with machine gun fire. And so there was a need for a combat replacement. Basically four or five days into the push, we had a, you know, a, a Kazavak of one of the members. And so we split our Banshee four apart, which was Memo and myself. And then I moved into Banshee two for the remainder of that push. And then some further pushes into the city uh, later on in December. And that's where I met and really became close with a gentleman by the name of Blake Cole, who uh, again, affected the trajectory of my life. So I check in uh, to uh, Banshee 2 in the middle of Fallujah in mid-November 2004, and I meet Sergeant Blake Cole, another man who has affected the trajectory of my life. And he sits me down. Blake Cole is not known for being the most sensitive of people in the world. He is very matter of fact. Uh, him and I have been close friends for a number of years since then. And he says, listen, I know, I understand that you have whatever, right? So you were, you know, he knows my reputation inside of the platoon that I got kicked out of the platoon for whatever. He's like, I don't give a shit. He's like, you work for me, you do what I say, we're gonna be just fine, right? And, I, and again, like we're, we're, doing, we're doing fine. I had kind of proved myself a little bit, but he's like, I'm gonna take you, you're part of the team now, don't worry about any other shit. So, okay, so I do that. So then we push into and continue on the main push in November uh, in Fallujah until we stabilize. 
But what happens right after we stabilize in Fallujah in November of 2004, there is now a requirement to go into an adjacent part of the city and then push back north. So most people don't remember that in Fallujah there was a southern push and then there was a northern push to clear out um, a, a, an adjacent area. So in December of 2004, in the super, super cold winter, we're now doing the same thing and pushing back north just like we pushed south. And what our team did, Blake Cole put me in charge of the radio. So I was a radio guy and I liked radios. I understand radio wave propagation and how all that kind of works. So that was just my gig. I ran the radio, which means I was always very, very close to him. And we genuinely built a really good relationship. But what the sniper teams did in Fallujah at that time was at night, the company, it was almost like a weird kind of like cartoony thing. You know, it'd be like the cartoon of where like Wiley e. Coyotes like checking, like clocks in and the Roadrunners clocking in too. It was kind of like that in Fallujah where we would wake up in the morning and everyone would like have their breakfast. And then like 8 a.m. it was like game on, right? And then we would just start fighting. And then the sun would go down. We'd fight till dusk and the sun would go down and then everyone would go back to bed the insurgents included, right? There wasn't a lot of movement in between and it was like night fighting. It just wasn't a thing that happened very much. It was like very weird how we all just kind of fell into this rhythm. And so what the sniper teams did was and when the sun would set, what we would do is we would go forward into enemy territory and we would occupy a home and we'd set up sniper positions that were on a, a long axis or covering down a long road. Because what the insurgents were doing was they would fight and then they would fall back to an alternate position and then keep fighting and falling back. So what we use the snipers as is an opportunity to catch them when they were coming across uh, those roads. And so the infantry would fight, they would, we would, they would know where we were at, they'd fight, 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 and then we called them squirters, but squirters would pick up and move, and that's where our team would get to work and be able to stop these guys as they were falling back to an adjacent position. And we did that all through the December push until we finally moved, kind of stabilized everything, and then the stability operations in Iraq uh, or in, in Fallujah really turned too because they were moving towards an election in January timeframe, if I'm not mistaken. So. December to January, we're turning into stability operations, establishing you know local paying positions, local polling positions, local election positions, and then providing security. It went very much kinetic to non-kinetic very, very quickly in the, in the Fallujah timeframe. And so I remember Cole would sit and he would teach me mathematic equations. And what he did was I was in mathematically inclined. I wasn't great at math, but I was inclined to it. And so what he would do is he was so, so smart that he would teach me based off of bullet drop how to effectively shoot while looking through a car, over the car, under a bridge, and then hit my target, understanding the flight path of the bullet and the trajectory and the physics behind it. And then we would work out mathematic equations while we were in our downtime. So all he did was prepare me and work with me and teach me. And he did that with the other two pigs in the platoon or in the team as well, uh, James Powers and Tony Scardino. And he would just work with all of us and kind of, you know, get us kind of, he was the sniper in the team and we were the three pigs that were his protégés. And he took care of us as far as getting us ready. I was able to kind of prove myself in Fallujah, but there was still kind of a stigma. There was still kind of like, I was still the runt, right? No matter what I could do, right? No matter what, I was still always that guy. So when it came to give the first, the first nominations to sniper school out, I didn't get them. Like, so I was not called to go to sniper school. And so I stayed in the platoon after we got back from Fallujah and I didn't go to sniper school. I had one shot. Sniper school, the understanding is that it's, not okay to fail the school, but they had such a high attrition rate that it was understandable that people would fail sniper school. I wasn't afforded that opportunity. Blake sat me down and he was like, listen, we're not gonna, he's not gonna lie to you. You get one shot. And I went, okay. And he said, there's no going back. So I knew that. So I was a corporal at this time. And then in uh, 2005, after we had returned, cause we got back in April of 2005 from Fallujah and I was given my shot to go to sniper school. And I checked into sniper school and then started that path. So sniper school was terrible. <laughs> that was the uh, hardest school I'd ever been to. This is what I tell people about sniper school. I was in sniper school for three months. And while the information is different, the amount of information I learned in sniper school in those three months, I learned more in those three months than I did all four years of high school. 
because there's so much to know to be an expert of your craft. So while I operated as a sniper in, in, uh, in Fallujah, because I had a sasser and I was able to learn these things, I wasn't school trained and going to school, I had learned so much more because as a sniper, as a one and a two man team or a two Marine team, you're completely independent. So the same assets that an infantry company is able to spread across multiple people and the same responsibilities, they go down to two people inside of a sniper platoon. So you have to know everything. And then I met other Marines that really, really had the opportunity to take care of me. And that's where I met a, name, a guy by the name of Wesley Payne. And he was a sniper instructor. He came from 3-1. And he looked after me. And Dave Slavsky, Wesley Payne, Aaron Brandfast, like those guys, they really, to Owen Mulder, they like took care of me. Dan Lelota, I am not like the worst person in the world, I swear. But like, here's the thing. So I go to Scout Sniper School and Scout Sniper School, Camp Pendleton, you show up doing 20 pull-ups, only 12 of those are gonna count, right? Because they were like super strict. It's just the way it was, right? So here's what happens. I can't believe I'm saying this story publicly. I go to Sniper School. And you have to run a first class PFT to get into sniper school, period. I run a 225 exactly. Because remember, like you show up doing 20 pull-ups only, you know, if you don't come full lockout or what you kip or whatever the thing is, nope, nope. Like you, I got like 80 sit-ups, right? When everyone gets a hundred ever, you know? And so, and you're right. So I get 225, which is the first class PFT minimum there to get into sniper school. So I like make it. Come to find out somebody screwed the math up. So three days later, somebody goes through and like adjudicates the scores and they find out I actually ran a 224 PFT. So I technically didn't meet the requirements to go into sniper school. And now they're forced with a dilemma. Blake Cole, unbeknownst to me at the time, comes down and speaks with the staff non-commissioned officer in charge and goes to bat for me and convinces them that it's one point, who gives a crap, let them go. And then I have this target on my, once they decide to keep me in, I have this target on my back. Holy moly, I got a lot of extra training in sniper school <laughs> to, to make sure that I was physically fit before I left there. I worked through there, I studied my ass off, and I listened to the instructors, and they were some of the smartest, most capable, most like war-hardened guys I'd ever met. And I was fortunate enough that when I graduated sniper school, I was able to graduate as the little pig who couldn't, who technically didn't meet the requirements to enter into the course. I was able to, because of the instructors and, and, and just their tutelage, I graduated both the honor graduate, which is top of the class and instructor's choice. And the instructor's choice is the instructors vote on who they would most like to serve in combat with. So I was blown away with that. And I owe it all to them. Right, all I was was a sponge to them and I just listened, right? And so I was able to move through that and, and then when I graduated in 2005, in September of 2005, then I was able to come back to my sniper platoon as a school trained sniper. I had a lot of extra time with the instructors uh, because of the physical stuff that I needed to get. So like I had a lot of face time, which, which, which is really good. But then, like I said, I dedicated my life to becoming a sniper. So here's what I did in sniper school, and this is what I recommend to a lot of people nowadays, was I lived in a little apartment in San Clemente, and what I did was on my window or my mirror in my apartment, I took a dry erase marker, and I wrote the word scout sniper in dry erase marker. So every morning at like 04, right, when I was waking up and shaving my face every single morning to go to work, I looked and envisioned myself as a scout sniper, and I talked to myself, you're gonna do this, you're going to push through this, you're going to make it. So visualization was a huge aspect for me. And then it put me in the right mindset to go into sniper school and work with the instructors as best as possible. And I listened and I got a few what we call pig hugs along the way. 3-5 sniper platoon and our platoon sergeant at the time was fantastic because normally a sniper platoon will generally deploy with four to six snipers and the remainder of the platoon are pigs. And so the difference between a hog and a pig, a hog is a school trained sniper uh, at the time in 8541 is the MOS designator. And that stands for hunter of gunmen. And then a pig is a colloquial term. We use it as the term stands for professionally instructed gunmen. You're a sniper in training. So I spent 18 months as a pig. I deployed to Fallujah as a pig after Fallujah got my chance to go to sniper school and then became a hog. What our platoon sergeant was able to do and the team leaders who helped train everybody up was when we deployed 
back to Iraq in a 24-man platoon going back to Iraq, we had 22 hogs in the platoon. So literally everybody was a school trained sniper because they trained everyone so well. So again, a testament to the leadership before we deployed. And so, yeah, we go back to Iraq in, in uh, 2000, and, uh, technically end of 2005, beginning of 2006. I was not a team leader. I was part of Banshee 2, and I worked for a gentleman by the name of uh, Jimmy Proudman. He was the sergeant, I was the corporal. Uh, and in our team, we had four school trained snipers. Gabe White, Jimmy Proudman was the team leader, Tony Scardino and myself were the four snipers. And we went back into Fallujah and the surrounding areas. So this is my third deployment in effectively like three years. So I joined, I, my first deployment was 2003, this was 2005. So like in, uh, I think it was like 36 months, I had spent you know 20 of them overseas at that point. So go back on my third deployment, I'm super confident. I've learned a lot. I've seasoned, right? I've seen a lot of this stuff. And now we're in this really interesting time frame in 2005 and 2006 in Iraq where the insurgency is kicking. Like they're trying to fight, you know, IEDs was a very big thing at the time frame, right? Rocket attacks was super big. Before we deployed, some videos started to surface up online. And the videos would be posted on like Ogreish or like Live Leak. And what it was, was there was this faction of, of insurgents that had started to post sniper videos online to be able to show uh, what they were able to do to American forces. And they were pretty, pretty graphic. And what they would do is they would effectively uh, be videotaping an American service member, at, you know, standing at a post or next to a Humvee or whatever it was. They would start the video off with um, a call to prayer and a call to prayer that had like horses like neighing at the end. And it was very much like a militant call to prayer. And then it would have a masked man, right, in a full face mask, right? And he would be talking about, you know, the one true God, right? And then he would talk about, you know, killing the infidels. And that's what he did. And the he used the pseudonym uh, Juba was what they kind of started calling themselves. Uh, now, there are probably multiple people that were Juba, I believe, in, you know, in hindsight, but I think that there was one predominant person that was, in fact, Juba. And so what they started to do was post these videos. And they, you know, snipers have a saying that's uh, kill one, terrorize a thousand. And what they had done, these videos had done, and their actions had really terrorized the American service members. Everybody was thinking about snipers because they would get really, really close, and then they would just, I mean, just wipe out hundreds of Americans doing this over time. And so that was always on our radar, coming back over to Iraq in 06. So we go to a town called, uh, we, in southwest of Fallujah, a town called Ferris Town, and then a town called Amaria. And we start working in and around there. And so our sniper team goes and attaches to India Company. And then for us in this deployment, it was quite fun for us because we had Everybody at this point had been to Iraq a number of times, so we all knew what we were doing. We we're starting to get a whole bunch of experience. And then for us, we just hunted. We would go out at night, spend a couple of days out. We'd like, we think that there's stuff going on here. We'd work with the company commander, Captain Len Coleman. We'd worked with him um, and be like, hey, we're gonna try this out. We're gonna go here. And he's like, sounds great. We built a really good rapport uh, with the company commander and the officers and the staff and NCOs in the company that they trusted us completely. But what happened is, because of American foreign policy, Marine doctrine, right, kind of the way that we were, the infantry themselves didn't have a lot of offensive capabilities in the stability operations timeframe, right? We called it SASO, which is Stabilization and Support Operations, I think it was, or something along those lines. And so you really had infantry forces who would go and take over a building or a compound and like make a firm base out of it. And then they would stay in place to keep the supply lines open uh, along main supply routes, whose job was to supply the locations that had to keep the supply routes open. So like they were just in like, these firm bases and that led them to be a lot of targets. And so a lot of the infantry was frustrated because they didn't have the opportunity to go get the enemy. They didn't have a lot, like, they would run patrols, but they were really like reactive. And so for a long time, the snipers were the only offensive capability that our commanders had was to go out, get into a clandestine position and go hunt the enemy where they, you know, where they thought that they were safe. So one of the operations that we were in, we were in Amaria, we're with two sniper teams came together for this one. We had Banshee 2, 
and I think it was Banshee 4, I think it was Valentine's Day, if I remember correctly, in 2006, and we're sitting in this hide site. We have eight snipers, and we're in adjacent to the Zidon area, which is like the western edge of the Euphrates and Amaria. So we plan this mission, and our sniper teams go out. We join forces, and we're sitting there. And so I'm sitting in this hide site. We all have ghillie suits on. We're all in this area, and I'm sitting there. It's the middle of the day. It's getting hot, right? And I made a fatal mistake. I don't know why I keep telling you stories about how terrible I am and when I screw up. I don't know why that's like self-deprecating, but that's what, here's the story how I totally screwed up. So I'm sitting there, right? And this helped later on when I became a sniper instructor because part of the lessons that they teach you in sniper school is never take your gear off, never take your gun off of you, like any of the things, right? So it's the middle of the day, nothing's been going on for like 48 hours. I'm on watch, right? But I'm not like behind a sniper rifle. There's no sniper target thing that I'm looking for. So here's what happens. I'm sitting there and I'm in a ghillie suit, right? And I, like everyone else is kind of asleep. So I'm just chilling. We got one person open uh, who's awake, you know, kind of checking our six. And I'm sitting there and I have a knife in my hand, right? And I'm sitting, again, nothing is happening, right? I haven't seen a person all day. I'm cleaning my fingernails. I'm just bored, right? You know, but I'm awake, right? My team is, it's the middle of the day, rest in, right? And then all of a sudden I like, I like see two people walking towards us, right? And I like look up very slowly, right? Cause very still movements in a ghillie suit. We're in some big deep bushes. And I walked, I watched these two guys who are literally making a beeline for us. They're walking directly towards us. And I'm like trying to like, you know, get people awake, right? On their back, they have an AK-47, right? And they have a video camera in their left hand and they're talking about it. And they're walking, like they're now, 50 feet, 25 feet, they're moving towards us. And I'm like, oh crap. The hiding spot that we chose apparently is the same hiding spot that they like to choose. And so they're walking into my hide site. They, have, they cannot see us. They get to within five feet of us, right? And the only thing that I have in my hand, my rifle is now next to me, but I can't grab it without them knowing, without seeing movement. So all I have is a fixed blade knife. So what I do is as they like, about, like, like I'm hoping that someone else is gonna see this, nothing, I'm like, you know, I'm like letting people know, I jump out of the bushes with this knife in my hand, right? And, my, rah, and I'm yelling to get my team awake, right? And I jump after these guys, and then I and they they like they freak out because a bush just jumps out at them, right? And they turn and start running. But then I realize as I'm chasing them, I don't have a gun on me, right? I have a knife. I've literally taken a knife to a gunfight and I'm yelling. Fortunately, I have a team of very, very good professionals who then wake up. Tony Scardino is on the parasol. He's ripping. Jared Ramsey's got the suppressor right on his M16A4, and they start ripping. We end up, you know, taking care of these guys and then finding their video camera afterwards. And we exploit their video camera and find out that the two, I mean, talk about dumb luck. These two guys were a local IED making cell who had videotaped them building IEDs, detonating IEDs, and then literally walked into our lap. And then we, you know, killed them and then took their stuff, right? So it was like this huge win for everyone's like, oh man, snipers out there killing people. And I'm like, if you only knew, right? You know, I'm like, oh yeah, we're like totally got them, right? Like I was cleaning my nails and these dudes walked into me kind of thing, right? And I had nothing. All I did was alert everybody else. The team jumped to action. And I think it was like, Jared was, was crushing it because this dude was fighting, but like in a full sprint and like, and Jared had a super hard shot that he had to take and took it when he needed to. Scardino got the other guy with a saw. It was like fantastic. Like, it was amazing to see all the training come through. That's what happens when you have 22 school trained snipers in a platoon. Everybody is equally as capable, except for one person who brings a knife to a gunfight, right? So luckily they picked up the slack on that. But it was a great win for us and we took out an IED cell. And that turns to the next kind of starting, you know, processes for us. So in the winter or early spring of 2006, 35 was uh, given orders to move out of Amaria and into um, uh, Habania. Habania was an old uh, military barracks uh, for Iraqi military barracks. So it was like super cush for us. So we moved from where you have Baghdad and then Fallujah and then Ramadi, Amaria was right in the middle. And so when we move into Amaria, we start taking over for a National Guard unit uh, who is getting ready to go home. And when we do a battle handover, we go through their intelligence shop and we have some conversations with them. 
And we found out that they were spooked. Like this unit by the end of their deployment was like not even leaving friendly lines to go on patrols because they were so afraid of, they were kind of like hamstrung by the IED emplacers and a sniper. So there was a sniper in the area that was like really working some of these guys. So they were not, uh, not very happy with it. So what we did was the whole platoon went into what the army calls a TOC, right? So a tactical operations center, we call it a COC, command operations center. So we go into the TOC and we start talking with their intelligence anal analysts. And our whole platoon sits down and we start going over, we use like pins on a map a lot of times. And that, and we have incident reports. And so we start seeing incident reports in like little red pins that were sniper attacks. And there's a lot of sniper attacks in this AO uh, or area of operations. And so we are like, okay, we gotta figure this thing out. What we start doing is over the next like month or so, my team starts um, running um, kind of like CSI. We kind of start playing the tape backwards. So what we did was we found specifically on one occasion, we found an incident of where a soldier, I believe it was a Marine, uh, that was killed in an intersection. So the vehicle had pulled into an intersection and had remained static or you know uh, stagnant at this location for a long time. And he was in the, the turret of the Humvee and he was shot by a sniper and then killed almost immediately. Tr super, super tragic. But for us, what helped was like the identification of where it was at. So what we did was our platoon went out and we went kind of snooping. What we wanted to do is a term that we use is called turning the map around. So what we started to do was saying, okay, if I was this sniper who killed this Marine, how would I do it? And we started to, it's called a red cell analysis. So we started to go through this red cell. And one of the places that we found, we went into this building we went to the second floor of this building and we went outside. So the Iraqis, what they do during the summer is a lot of them will sleep outside on their roof. And so we went out to the roof and then lo and behold, this roof is overlooking directly this intersection. So we go to this place and immediately we find a spider hole. So a spider hole is about six inches, you know, kind of hole in a brick wall on the parapet or on the, the side railing of the roof itself. And then right behind that, so we have a spider hole that we look through is looking directly at the intersection. Right behind that, we have a uh, kind of like, you've ever seen like a New York cabbie, how they have like their car seats, but they're like bead, like a beaded card mat. They had that kind of mat laying on the ground directly behind the hole. And so we're like, crap, this is, this is, you know, leading into it. Well, we look for more evidence. And so here's a testament back to Marine Scout Sniper School. So at the time we used an internal magazine on the M40 A3 uh, weapon system. And the idea was shoot two, load two. So you shoot two rounds and you load two rounds. So you always have a full magazine of five in the sniper rifle. And then what you always do as a sniper is always cognizant of what we call target indicators. And a target indicator is anything a sniper fails or does to do that reveals his presence, his equipment, or his location to the enemy. Well, what we found at this location where this car mat was and the spider hole was, was two casings from a weapon system. So the sniper had left those casings there after he had killed the Marine. Well, I pulled the casings and I looked at the casing himself and on the back of the casing itself, it said LC, which stands for Lake City. That's where American, or American ammunition is manufactured. It's like Lake City, Utah, if I'm not mistaken. So that the hat kind of dropped for us. We're like, wait a second. This is an American munition that they're using inside of this thing. So it really piqued our interest. So here's what happens to kind of play back into a story that happened in 2004. In 2004 in Ramadi, uh, four uh, Marines uh, who were with 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines, and their sniper platoon were um, occupying a hide site. Um, and they were occupying a hide site that they had used habitually, that the unit had used habitually, and they set sort of a pattern. Well, on the first floor, what we know, everything's kind of shrouded in mystery, but what we know now was the first floor was effectively like under construction or it had like a bustling business. There was a lot of foot traffic that kind of went on in there. And what they used was they had the snipers in a static position. So contrary to sniper employment doctrine, we don't use snipers as an overt threat. It's like we don't put them up there to show that snipers are in the area. We like to stay kind of hidden in the shadows. And so what they did there was they, one, they were kind of an overt area, right? And then two, they reoccupied the same hide site repeatedly. So they set a pattern. What we know is that eventually on a 
there was a firefight. There was something that happened and a patrol had moved into the area and discovered the four Marine sniper team from 2-4 who were all killed. Um, and then with them went all of their equipment. Tommy Parker was the team leader for 2-4 sniper team. When he was killed, his sniper rifle went with them. And so what had happened was that had eventually moved into Juba's hands. Whether Juba was there or not that day, we don't know, but it moved into Juba's hands eventually. And Juba was using Corporal Tommy Parker's weapon system to kill hundreds of American service members over the two years from when the rifle was lost uh, until we got to the area in 2006. So we, we knew that they were using an American sniper rifle. We knew through other stories that the sniper was a very well-trained sniper. And so what we did is we re-looked at all the videos that, that Juba had produced. And this was an exercise that was really hard for our team because effectively I had to watch hours of video of American service members going through their last moments of life before they were hit and killed by a sniper. It's excruciating to watch. But what the sniper did was his hubris was effectively his downfall. What he wanted to do was broadcast to the world what he did and how effective he was. But what he did for us was he gave us information about him. What we knew from kind of the from from from, from the observations was that he was relatively close to his target because the sniper rifle at that time could reach out to about a thousand meters, but the problem was the uh, camera equipment couldn't reach out to that distance as well. So what we saw was that normally the, the modus operandi was that they would be within 100 to 200 meters of their target. They would be relatively low to the ground, and then they would be in and around the local populace. Well, this meant two things for us. Either the local populace was in on the sniper being there, so they knew that he was there and they were going on about their business, or they were completely unaware of the sniper being there. So what happened is after the sniper would shoot, the Marine or soldier or airman would fall. There would be, I saw countless acts of heroism while watching these videos of an American service member would get struck in the, in the chest, in the neck or in the head. And then another American service member would run into the fray and run back where this Marine or soldier had just been hit and guard him, shield him, do her, whatever they needed to do, knowing that they were at risk. And so I saw hundreds of acts of absolute valor, of which really played true to the American identity of being there for one another. And then immediately following, I would see the panic on the populace. So they would start kind of running around, they would hear a gunshot. So the civilian population would start running around. So then I knew that the, or we, our team had kind of surmised that the population didn't know that this person was there. And then almost every single time after a shot was fired, the camera would then move away from the area at a very high rate of speed, but it wouldn't bounce as if somebody was walking. So what we recognized, what we kind of painted was that the potential for this person to be inside of a vehicle, low to the ground, kind of at the, at the waistline where the camera was at, moving away at a high rate of speed and was able to hide in plain sight. So that's what we started to look for was kind of vehicles uh, in that area. Now we know that there's a sniper in the area. We know that there's IED in places in the area. Um, we are at a place called OP Falcons. And OP Falcons is an, on and along um, MSR or Main Supply Route, Michigan, which connects uh, Ramadi to Fallujah. Al Takadam is here, and then Habania is here. And so we're kind of keeping the supply lines open, right? So we are the vein between Ramadi and Fallujah. The Army owns basically the 5-5 five, five Easting and West, which is Ramadi's battle space, and the Marine Corps kind of picks up uh, and then handles the Fallujah kind of area as well. So we're an hour on a gap of where the two battle lines cross. We're at OP Falcons, and what happens is we go through this, we set up this new firm base and we establish this you know, perimeter, and then we're in and around this area, and it becomes very kinetic very, very quickly. There's a ton. We, as the Marines, go out and become very offensive. We're like, we are here. We're not going to stay back in this base. We're going to establish a presence, and that pisses off the Mujahideen. So they're all over the place, and they're fighting back, and so it's super kinetic for about a month, month and a half number of engagements, rocket engagements, et cetera. And then what we do is we set an OP Falcons 
and right in front of OP Falcons, this is how the whole mission kind of comes to fruition. So in front of OP Falcons, we're on a hill that's overlooking MSR Michigan. We can cover a couple of kilometers to the west, come a couple of kilometers to the east. But in front of us, directly in front of OP Falcons, is about a 200 meter span of the road that is considered dead space. We can't see it because of other houses in the way. There's just no way that we can cover this space. So dead space for us is anything that you can't uh, observe through direct observation or fire or hit with direct fire. And so the enemy exploits this. So what happens is on like a routine patrol, a track is driving along MSR Michigan, hits an IED in the dead space in front of OP Falcons, detonates, blows a track off, there's a casualty inside of it. Well, the way that the Marine Corps had aligned to be able to establish a presence on the western edge of our boundary in MSR Michigan, remember the 5-5 Easting, we had either an M1A1 Abrams tank or an AAV, one of our tracked vehicles, would be at that western location as a static position. So at OP Falcons, when the IED hits, the track leaves the 5-5 Easting to go provide medevac support to help the wounded out of the, uh, you know, out of the incident in front of OP Falcons. They go back to the 5-5 Easting 45 minutes later, and they hit an IED. So now what we know is we have an IED cell that's in the area that's, that's, that's very quick. As soon as a gap opened, it ex it's exploited by the enemy. So here's what we do is myself and an adjacent team leader, Sergeant Jimmy Proudman, who was my team leader earlier in the deployment, I had ended up moving over and I took over Banshee 4, Sergeant Proudman maintained at Banshee 2, so I had my own sniper team. We come up with this mission to be able to use the absence of Marines as bait. Never do I wanna use Marines as bait because the worm on the hook normally gets eaten, right? So we don't wanna use Marines as bait, we use the absence of them as bait. So we established this mission to draw out a sniper, an ID emplacer. We want to be able to, the enemy to believe that they are area where there is no Marine coverage. So what we do is we establish a mission from OP Falcons, we leave in the middle of the night and we move over to the 5-5 Easting, the western edge of the boundary. And also doctrinally speaking, when you have boundary spaces uh, between you know, adjacent units, that's usually a pretty good area for the enemy to exploit because they're on the Western or Eastern, they're on the fringes of battle space. So the idea is to get into position in the middle of the night and then at 07 the next morning to have the vehicle that's covering the 5-5 Easting depart rapidly, like they're responding to some sort of emergency and then leaving the place vacant. What we want to do is we want to lull the enemy into a sense of comfort and allow them to operate freely. So here's what happens as we get into the position. I'm on the eastern side. So now my sniper team is covering north and east along Route Michigan. Jimmy Proudman's team, Banshee 2, is covering north and west along MSR Michigan. And we're covering effectively six kilometers of space east and west down this area. So we get into position. Everything is good. 07 that morning, we uh, identify the tracks are going to take off and they're going to leave us be and they're going to leave the place completely vacant. The trap is now set. The enemy believes that there is no American presence in the area and they should be able to move about freely. So here's where things get interesting. AJ Barth, who was our platoon corpsman at the time and one, and in my team, is with us, right? And so what we do is we have two gun positions set up, one looking north and one looking east, and we split into two-man teams. So AJ and I are on a gun um, looking north, and we have that position. Uh, we have Brett Stidful and then Sergeant Kevin Homestead from the infantry squad that's with us, right? Because we took an infantry squad with us to help bolster our numbers, right? Because we don't want to get ambushed, right? So we have Sergeant Kevin Homestead from Kilo Company 3-5, who's working with, uh, with Corporal Stidful covering to the east. At 07, Doc comes up to me, and so we're both named AJ, right? So he comes up and he goes like, hey, AJ, uh, why don't you go lay down? I'm feeling pretty good. You take, you like, I'll take first watch. Uh, you go to sleep. So here's how things kind of happen. We were going to go 50%, which means he's awake and I'm asleep for one hour at a time. And we're going to rotate back and forth. But what happens is he wakes me up at 9am. So I go down at seven. He wakes me up at nine and he says, don't dude, I was good. 
I felt good, so I just did an extra hour, give you an extra hour of sleep. I appreciate that. But what he did, unbeknownst to him, was he affected the schedule of how things were supposed to go. So at 9 a.m., I get up, he goes down, and he's never going to forgive me for telling the story. He says, I'm going to go take a shit. Don't kill anybody while I'm gone, right? So what he does is he grabs a wag bag, and he's going to go downstairs and go, you know, take a crap, right? So uh, and we, like, joke about it. So now I'm on the gun. It's 9 a.m. It's already starting to get hot, right? Because this is June in Iraq, so it's like a billion degrees already. I throw in uh, uh, what we called formaldehagen, so it's like overseas-worthy Copenhagen. It's like the plastic. So, And I'm sitting there because I'm just like waking up, or I'm cruising, and then I just get behind the gun, right, and I'm establishing my sectors. I'm going through, and I'm just doing what we call a 50-meter overlapping strip search. We read left to right, so I'm going from right to left. I look at the area that I'm looking at, and I cover a 50-meter swath, and I work my way through it like a typewriter, and then I come back, and I'm just, and I'm bored out of my mind. It's like the middle, like nothing's happening, right? Well, then all of a sudden I'm coming back, you know, it's probably 10 minutes in, 15 minutes in, and all of a sudden I, a, a vehicle pulls up, you know, nothing going on. I see a, a you know, a normal four-door sedan pull up. I'm overlooking kind of a market is kind of where I'm looking at. And this vehicle pulls up with nothing, you know, nothing super crazy. I see a guy get out and he goes over to a local chai shop, right? So I'm like watching him go grab some tea. Cool, no, nothing, nothing out of the ordinary. Another 15 minutes kind of goes by or 10 minutes kind of goes by. And then all of a sudden I am scanning across towards the left, west, like left edge of my area and I catch a glare. And a glare hits, the sun hits the lens on something and glares back at me and I look at it. At the time, we had the brand new scope, the Schmidt and Bender 8541 scope, which is a variable power optic on the sniper rifle. So I have the sniper rifle, I have it zoomed out because I'm scanning, and all of a sudden this glare happens. And so I zoom in, and when I zoom in, I see on the back right quadrant of this car. So imagine the rear passenger door, the window between the rear passenger door and the back windshield, there's like a, you know, Seaman sedans, there's kind of like a triangle kind of thing in the back. Inside of that little window, I see a Sony Handycam and I about fall over because that doesn't mean good for us, right? I'm immediately thinking, you know, some, something bad's going on. 10 minutes beforehand. So remember, so here's the timeline. Doc gets up, says, don't take a, sh you know, don't kill anybody. I'm going to go take a shit, right? So he cruises out in between that time frame. And when I see the Sony Handycam, a track on a routine patrol from India Company 3.5 pulls up into our space. They're not supposed to be there, right? So I call up, their call sign's red one. The person I'm talking to, the squad leader, is a friend of mine, Sergeant Kyle Burton. And I'm like, hey, Red One, Red One, this is Banshee Four. We're running a mission here. Just to let you know, uh, you know, I got to have you bug out of here pretty soon. And he's like, yeah, sounds good. We're letting our engines cool down. We'll be out of your hair in 10 minutes. In all this time, so that the vehicle is there, the track has moved into effectively this kill zone, and now I'm, and then, and then I discover the camera. So I see the camera, I call back up to Red One with, this is within five or 10 minutes. Red One, Red One, button up, you're about to get hit. I can't see Red One because there's a building in front, but I can hear the engine, blah, 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 blah. I can hear the diesel engine running and kind of cooling down. And then what happens is I'm watching the camera and now I'm freaking out. Technically, that is positive ID. I can kill whatever that is. Here's the problem. I haven't seen anybody in the car yet. I saw a guy get out of the car and go to the chai shop, but I can't see him right now. So Brett Stidful is looking this direction down the road, can't see the chai shop. I can't see the chai shop. So there's just an empty car with a video camera in it. So my first answer as a Marine, blow it up, right? So the first thing I do is I get on the hook and I'm trying to call up to TQ because I hear cobras in the air. So I'm trying to source cobras to just go shoot the crap, shoot a toe at this thing and blow this thing up. Well, what happens is as they're getting ready to be able to spin up, we're inside of 400 meters north of us is a mosque. And 500 meters around a mosque to the coalition is what's called an NFA, a no fire area. No uh, munitions other than direct fire munitions from small caliber weapons can go near a mosque. So this car is within 400 meters of the mosque, so the Cobras can't play. 
we call over to TQ, to Al Takatum, where there's an artillery battery. I'm trying to get artillery to shoot. I'm shooting grids, right? I got my, my range finders, give them grids, nothing. We try to get mortars from OP Falcons. Same thing is they're too close to this. At this time, the battalion commander is on a routine patrol running down Route Michigan, who's hearing all this chatter kind of go along. Captain Len Coleman, the company commander for India Company, is listening as well. And so as this thing starts to progress, it kind of starts moving to a crescendo. Also inside of the car itself, I didn't know what I was looking at then. I know now what I was looking at, but I could see the camera, nothing really else, but kind of a slender shape of a square is all I could, but it was something that was like, it was, I looked at it, but it didn't really resonate to me, right? The camera was what I was super focused on, a Sony Handycam with a flip open screen. After I had read one button up, within moments, as all of this is happening simultaneously, I see a hand come forward and start messing with the camera. This is my first indication that there is a person in the car. And I, reminder, it's 100 million degrees. I have a lip full of Copenhagen, right, at the time, and it's dry, and I'm like, rah, rah, you know, tr I'm on the radio, I'm trying to like, you know, all this is kind of happening at, at one moment, and I see a hand come forward, and I'm like, something's about to happen, right, you know, and I'm explaining this, to everyone's kind of paying attention now. Len Coleman comes over the radio, and he breaks protocol. You know this is a Marine, and he breaks protocol, and he goes, Pashuti, take the shot. And I'm like, Roger that, sir. And like, you know, and then I go all math. I'm like, well, you know, the if I shoot above here, it's gonna blah blah. He's like, Pashuti, take the shot, right? And I'm like, Roger. So then I line up. And what I do is the hand is now gone. Above the Sony handy cam, what I decide to do is I I, I decide to go about about two inches above the Sony handy cam. I'm gonna put one round through the window to break the glass, and then I'm gonna put two follow-up rounds behind it to make sure that they can penetrate through it. Because what happens is when a bullet or a projectile hits, hits a medium, I can't affect, I don't know where it's going to go. So I could shoot it and it could wing out this direction. So I have to break the glass. So I break the glass and then I send two more immediately right through it. And then all hell breaks loose. So what happens now is there's a family in the home that we're occupying, right? So the night before we like knock on the door and then make our way in and like, hey, by the way, it's our house now, right? We put them in a special room, right? But here's what happens is they hear the civilian populace hears the report of three rounds coming from an M40 series sniper. They just hear three gunshots, right? And the neighborhood starts freaking out, right? Because they don't know what's going on. People are screaming all over the place. People are running through the streets, right? And now, mind you, there were three rounds that came out of an M40 series sniper rifle. So now I get off the gun because I have no idea what's going on in there, in that car. And now I'm on a knee. Sergeant Kevin Homestead comes from the other room and I, he's an avid hunter, right? I'm from San Francisco. Like I've never hunted a day in my life. The only mammal I've ever hunted walks on two feet, right? So he's explaining to me, you know, previously in the deployment about mule deer and white tails, and I'm learning all this stuff, right? So he's an avid hunter. So I'm like, Kevin, get on the gun, right? So he gets on the gun. I'm on the radio because now what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get Sergeant uh, Kyle Burton over to this vehicle because I just saw somebody in there and I just shot a couple of times in there, but I've never, I haven't seen any movement yet. So I have to get him across a wadi over there, so I'm directing traffic. As that happens, the spotter gets up from the tea shop, and he walks over nonchalantly to the vehicle, and he's making a beeline for it. And I'm on the radio, and Homestead's on the gun, right? And Homestead's not a sniper, so this is kind of like a faux pas, but I don't, I'm also the team leader, so I get to make that decision. And him and I are like in awe, as this guy's like, the dude that I just saw walk out of the car is now walking towards it. Here's what happens is I got in trouble from the battalion commander earlier in the deployment because I had shot uh, a couple of bad guys in the middle of a road and then a ve an unmarked vehicle came up that didn't have a Red Crescent or a Red Cross and then like helped provide aid to these guys and then pulled them away, right? Well, the battalion commander was like, why didn't you shoot the people driving the vehicle? I was like, well, I figured they were helping him. It wasn't my thing. You know, he's like, no. As soon as they touch another combatant or they touch a vehicle, they become a combatant themselves. 
Roger that, sir, I'll make sure of it, right? Kind of got reprimanded for doing my job as a sniper and killing two dudes, right? But like, whatever, right? So now the ROEs are set. Homestead knows, Homestead's on the gun, He it's 187 meters, right? Homestead's on the gun and I said, as soon as this guy touches the car, he becomes a combatant. And so we wait and he walks across. Remember, he heard three reports from an M40 series rifle. He's the spotter. He gets up, walks towards the vehicle, opens, so the vehicle's parked this way to me, so the rear of the vehicle's here, and it's kind of kind of diagonal to me. He opens up the passenger side front, passenger side door. As soon as he touches it, he opens it up. Kevin shoots him one in the chest, right in the chest, right? And then the guy falls to his knees, right? And then Kevin shoots him again through the side of the chest. And then he's still moving around. So then he proceeds to crawl inside of the vehicle, and he gets up to where... Now, mind you, again, he crawls over to the driver's side of the vehicle and he puts his butt in the driver's side of the vehicle and then his feet are over the center console and in the passenger side of the front side of the vehicle, if that makes sense. And I can't see him. So now he's kind of behind a, a seat cushion and I can't see him. The only thing, so now I get Kevin off the gun because now there's more shooting happening. The track is still making their way around this thing. Kevin, I got this. I get back on the gun, and then what I do is all I can see is this dude's legs, and so I don't want him to be able to grab a gun and hurt the Marines that are coming over there and catch the jump on him, and so I don't want him moving around, so I all I see are his knees, and so I shoot both of his knees so that he can't move anywhere, right? And so, because I can't get a clean shot onto him, right? Now there's more shots coming out. The, pot, the, the civilians are screaming everywhere. They, I don't know what they're thinking, right? The people in the house are screaming. Chaos, right? Sergeant Burton and his track come up to the vehicle. And I'm like, hey, like Kyle, like red one, right? I said, there is a man in the front of the vehicle. I don't know if he's alive or dead, right? You know, be cognizant of that, right? And then there's also another person in the vehicle that I didn't see move or leave the vehicle. Like, be careful, right, with that. So he comes up. The first person in the vehicle, the, the spotter who's in the front of the vehicle, eventually what happens is he succumbs to his wounds, right? And he dies in the time that before Kyle's guys can get there. And then what I see is they're like, yeah, Roger, he's here. And I'm talking, the infantry and snipers love working together, right? Because I'm an angel on their shoulders. I'm covering them, right? And they're trusting me. So I'm talking directly to the squad leader. And he's like, yeah, that guy's gone, right? And I said, okay, in the back left window, he like opens up the thing. He's like, yeah, there's another dude in here. And I said, okay. And he's like, yeah, he's dead. I'm like, oh, well, that was miraculous, cool. And I said, in the back left corner window, there's a Sony Handycam. And so what he does is he holds it in the air for me and he shakes it in the air. I'm like, yeah, that's it. So this other guy, now we've got the guy in the front of the car that's dead, the guy in the back of the car is somehow dead. And then he's like, yeah, there's something else in here. And I was like, and he goes, it looks like a rifle. And I went, what? And then all of a sudden we went, oh shit. That was the square that I saw. It was a rifle pointing down. So what I saw was effectively the buttstock of the sniper rifle. And he says, it looks American. And so what he did was when he grabbed it, he took it like, the, now his back is to me. He grabs it and he puts it in the track. And I'm like, whoa, 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 what is that, right? And he says, I don't know, it looks American. And so I ask him, what are the first two serial numbers, the first two digits of the serial numbers? Every Marine sniper rifle starts off very similarly. The, now there are some nuances, right? It's a it's an Echo or it's a November, right? So for me, an, an A3 series sniper rifle was Echo 676. And so I ask him to repeat what the serial number is. And he says, yeah, it says Remington 700. And then he reads the serial number to me. And at that point, we realized, holy shit, this is 2-4's sniper rifle. So what we do, is we like start freaking out right inside of there. And now there's kind of like a riot starting to form. Like people, the population is like not super happy. And so uh, chaos is starting to ensue. So then what we do is we start breaking down our hide site, both guns, teams, Banshee 2 is getting out, Banshee 4 is getting out. And then as we get out of this, you know, uh, kind of scene, we start going down an alley. People are starting to be pretty unrestful. And then we get into the back of this track and then Kyle hands me the sniper rifle and it's a Marine sniper rifle. And what I do is I take the last bullet out of it. So there's bullets chambered inside of that. I take the last bullet out of that. 
I was 3-5, they were 2-4. We're sister battalions. We're in the same regiment. It was a weapon system that was lost by 2-4, recovered by 3-5. And so what we did was we took the last bullet that was chambered and we provided that back to 2-4. So it turns out after everything that when I looked at the video camera that the sniper had, he had another number of footage of, of you know service members that were being killed. The unfortunate part is is that when his hand was reaching over to mess with the camera, he was turning it off. As I watched the video, you see Red One, you see the person in the TC hatch, the squad leader who was leading the squad, he was the target for the sniper. And when I say Red One, Red One button up, he looks left, he looks right, and he slams the TC hatch closed. And then I'm, tr and simultaneously, this is when I'm trying to call for fire. I'm trying to get the munitions over there. He recognizes that his shot went away. And so what he does is he reaches a hand forward and turn the camera off. Here's the thing. One, it was seconds later that we killed him, right? But inside of that video clip, of which is very much classified and moved away, right? And I haven't seen it since. You could see my hide sight. You could not see me, but also in that sniper's view was the row of buildings where I was at and the window that my, that my position was sitting behind, but you couldn't see us. We almost got a, uh, a, a, a counter Juba video, right? Of where Juba was killed by an American sniper. We had originally set out a mission that was specifically set up to entrap both ID and placers, snipers, or you know, whatever, you know, whatever kind of groups that they had forward. And because of a little bit of luck, because of some chance, the sniper moved into the area. Red One became the target, unbeknownst to us. We saved Red One by that, and that ended up being the sniper's demise. And then we took the sniper rifle back to uh, uh, Camp Habania, and then we turned it over to the Marine Corps. I have to say this, right? So there's a reason why I've begun to talk about it publicly now. One, I'm retired. Two is this. People in the past, when, when it initially happened, it was kind of a spike. There was a, a story that was done on it. Our platoon chose not to take any credit for it. It was just simply 3-5 sniper platoon. We didn't take any credit for it. It was in the article, it specifically says, you know, 21-year-old Marine sniper, right, from like Northern California. I think that was the most detail that was given. We didn't claim it. It wasn't, so for me, I was simply the trigger finger, right? It was supposed to be Doc Barth's rotation, right? It, you know, if he hadn't given me, if Red One hadn't shown up, right? All of these opportunities happened a specific way that any one of us that were in that position would have done the same thing. I'm fully confident of that. So the idea wasn't to take fame from it or, you know, glory from it. So we just didn't take any real credit for it. What became problematic over time was reports started to surface over time that other people were claiming credit for that kill because nobody had effectively claimed credit for it. And the part that really plagued me was one, they were monetizing it, of which I don't believe they should monetize anything like that. And two, there are really three parts to the story itself. The first part has to do with Corporal Tommy Parker and his sniper team in 2004. The second part of the story is what Juba did with it for two years while he was running around hurting Americans. And the third part is how 3-5 got it back. The problem is when people were telling the story, there were incidents that like people were at SHOT Show, there was a very heavy innuendo that a very famous American sniper had done that at the end of a film, from what I'm told. So a, a lot of a lot of fill in the blanks that people would kind of naturally do that. But that was not what it was about. That didn't honor the four Marines that lost their lives, right? Defending that rifle, right? You know, uh, and and then eventually losing that. So I felt that that was the opportunity to say, hey, listen, this is not an AJ Pichuti story. This is a Marine Corps story. This is an opportunity that says, this is a fifth Marine story, two, four, three, five, right? This is what we do. This is what all of this, the politics go out the window. This is about the other poor SOB that's out there that's trying to make it home alive too. And I'm trying to help him just like he's trying to help me. And when they don't make it home, it is our duty to live and honor them as best as possible. 
and at times avenge their deaths. And that's what we were able to do. It was poetic justice is how Juba was killed. His own hubris was his own demise. Why we've come out from this, it has nothing to do with, what, with us wanting credit for it. It is simply because the idea is that we really wanted to make sure that these Marines were given you know, their, their due diligence for it, were given the, you know, the absolute honor of that. And again, the, the cyber platoon was very, very good about it. And then we just moved on and continued op operations the next day. I remember when the regimental combat team commander came out a couple of days later after it kind of spread around. And I remember we were at OP Falcons and my buddy, uh, Jimmy Proudman, and myself were like sleeping on this like isomat, right? You know, in this like dusty little place. And they, somebody kicks, so the, the regimental sergeant major comes up and kicks us awake. And I remember standing there, right? Uh, and they're like, oh yeah. And they point to Jimmy Proudman, right? <laughs> and it was funny. I remember this interaction very well. They point to Jimmy, the Sergeant Major goes, oh yeah, this is the guy that killed the sniper. And he points to Jimmy, right? And he's like, oh, and the Colonel's like shaking his hand, like, thank you so much for what you did. That's fantastic, right? And Jimmy goes, well, I mean, actually that was, uh, that was Sergeant Pasciutti over here. And both the Colonel and the Sergeant Major go, oh, okay. And then they turn around and walk away. Like, so from the beginning, it was like this total joke, like, yeah, Jimmy killed him, right? You know, it was this whole thing. But again, it was never about the credit. It was always about stopping this person and kind of, you know, putting an end to that cycle. That was an opportunity for us. That was one of the highlights of my career was being able to allow the, the collective exhale that the coalition felt when they knew that that strategic piece on the chessboard was taken off of the board. How many other people did we save? How many other Marines and soldiers and sailors and airmen, right, that we were able to say, like, you can sleep a little bit better tonight because that piece is off of the board. And it was kind of cool how it happened at the same time. Yeah, so after Iraq, I came home um, and then uh, went over to Scout Sniper School in Camp Pendleton and was a sniper instructor for about a year, uh, year and a half. Um, and then in that time frame, I, I took a lateral move and I moved over to become a reconnaissance Marine. And I went through basic reconnaissance course in Camp Pendleton. And in that course, I met a gentleman uh, by the name of the Sergeant uh, Matt Ingham. And him and I were immediate enemies just at, because he was a East Coast sniper, I was a West Coast sniper. We had this like Biggie Tupac thing going on, right? And he were, we were immediate enemies, uh, but kind of like a frenemy kind of thing where we like respected one another. So we check into BRC the same day. We're doing the whole like, you know, like dogs in a dog park, kind of sniffing each other out kind of thing. We were kind of not like, not like hurting each other enemies, but we were like, all right, cool. You know, like here's my competition kind of thing. Him and I ended up becoming like the best of friends. Um, he stayed on my couch every night during BRC. Uh, he also wasn't a very good swimmer. I was not a very good swimmer in basic reconnaissance course, which is amphibious reconnaissance, which you would think in the name that I would be good at it. I got better over time, but when it came to the physical stuff, I was fine, but the swimming, I was like, back to what I was used to being was like the runt of the litter uh, with swimming. So uh, he helped me a lot, We helped. I helped him. And so both him and I graduated BRC in, September of 2008, and we were the fiercest of competitors. And I never let him forget it, that I graduated honor graduate from the class. I was number one, and I beat him by 0.01%. And so he was number two in the class. And I rubbed it in his face any chance that I could, right? I called him number two, right? Like everything, it wasn't even Matt anymore. It's like, what's up number two? Uh, you know, just, you know how guys are, right? You know, or any Marines are. So I just rubbed it in his face, you know, continually. Matt was uh, truly better than me. I just had one, I think I found one land nav point or something like something like innocuous, like in the beginning of the course that was just like, ah. so Matt was better than me at every single thing he did. We got to 3rd Recon Battalion in Okinawa, Japan. We go to Bravo Company 3rd Platoon. And um, we're leading the platoon. So we don't have a platoon sergeant yet. And we're going through the process of like spinning this new platoon up. I've been to combat three times. He had been to combat three times. And so we have a brand new group of reconnaissance Marines uh, that we're like getting ready because now we're in the surge time frame, and Afghanistan is starting to pick up. So very long story short, Matt and I are the absolute continued fiercest competitors. He becomes a team leader, I'm a team leader. So he's a recon team leader, I'm a recon team leader. And then we go to, to Hawthorne, Nevada for one of our 
training evolutions. We have a platoon commander, Captain Kevin Kincaid, we have a platoon sergeant, gunnery sergeant, Efrain Martinez, and we have to decide who the number one team leader is. And we've been together for about a year at this point, it's 2009. Our teams are like at each other's throats because we're just, we're all trying to vie for the, for the number one position in the platoon, right? And so every time, so we just like the platoon commander platoons are like, well, whoever the best team is, right? So the number one position for us as the team leader, team one is the primary team, right? They're the varsity squad, right? And we go in and we have both assistant team leaders uh, and then both team leaders and the platoon sergeant and the platoon commander. And we're at the end of Hawthorne. We're like, all right, we got to decide who team number one, team number two, who wants it? And I'm, we're like, we both want team number one. He's like, anybody else? Anybody really care to give it up, right? And we're like, no, right? You know, and I'm, we're looking at each other. Now, mind you, he's my best friend in the entire world, but I'm not gonna let him beat. He's number two, right? That's his rightful place, right? Mm -hmm. We decide to flip a coin. So the platoon commander is like, all right, here it is, right? Matt, AJ, right? You guys flip a coin, right? And so we flip the coin and I don't remember 100%, but I think it was like, if it lands heads, AJ is team number one. And if it lands tails, Matt is team number one. And we flip the coin and we let it, we're like, all right, we're gonna let it land on the ground or whatever. And it lands heads up and Matt is furious. So he had this thing where he had like a little tooth that kind of grew in over the top. And so when he would get mad, he would he would like do that, but his lip would get stuck up here like a little dog, right? You know, and he was pissed. He's like two out of three, two out of three, right? You know, like typical Marine stuff, right? And he like didn't want to give up, right? And his little lip, and I was like, ah. and so like we didn't. He didn't talk to me for like two days after that. He was so mad at the fact because he believed that his team was better than my team, and I believed that my team was better than his. So fast forward, we we deploy. Uh, a few months later, we go to Afghanistan, and it's a very interesting time in Afghanistan. There's a lot of being a transition between NATO forces and where the Americans are coming in, and a big uh, push from the Obama administration to be able to kind of put this thing to bed. So we cruise out, we end up in an area called Nauzad, and Nauzad is in the southern boundary of the Hindu Kush mountain range, and it's in uh, kind of like the center of the Helmand province, and it's really in the middle of nowhere but it's surrounded by like really, really crazy valleys. You have the, the black mountains on one side and the white mountains on the other side and like huge scapes of valleys in between with like craggy mountains on either side. It was kind of a big farming community in, inside of the area. And it was a really big Taliban stronghold. Now Zad, Bar Now Zad, Kanjaki Olia, Kanjaki Sofla were like, what we consider Bar Nauzad was we considered that the enemy's rear area. The rear area is where an enemy has their commanders, their resupply lines. It is a very, very special place for them that they believe that they're safe. And so Matt and I's team continue to work out there for a number of months, trying to probe enemy lines and figure out stuff for the coalition to find. And so Matt goes out on a mission right before uh, New Year's. Um, he goes on a mission, as, this is in 2009 to 10. So, you know, December 30th-ish. We go out for about eight days at a time. It was like a long, so we would just eat cliff bars and like shiver. That's what we did for, you know, a, a week at a time up in these mountains. The Taliban hated us. They knew that we were out there, but they couldn't find us. And so they, they used the term for us. They called us tree people. They knew that we were always there. They knew that we were always watching, but they didn't know where we were at, but they hated us with a passion. And so there was a lot of like, effectively like hits put out on us, like to try to find the tree people and like kill all of them. On this Christmas or this, this New Year's mission, Matt and his team find the enemy's rear area. They find like this, almost like a black market bazaar kind of thing. They see like what would be at local area commanders, all kinds of stuff. So this generates a very, very big mission for 3rd Battalion, 4th Marines. And this is where things get interesting when it comes back to employment, like the employment with snipers, employment with reconnaissance Marines is very interesting as well. What they did was the employment agreement was that we were attached to 3rd Battalion, 4th Marines, which meant that we were owned by 3rd Battalion, 4th Marines, instead of direct support of 3rd Battalion, 4th Marines. That gives our us and our commander, when you're direct support versus attached, it gives a commander a little bit more leeway on what he or she wants to do. Like, we, we need you to go do X. He's like, mm, that's not really our gig, right? 
But when you're attached, we don't have that authority. It's an interesting kind of nuance, but it matters. So we were attached to 3-4. We generate this huge mission where Matt's team is going to go in into a, well, one team is going to go in very close to Bar Nauzad, and then another team is going to go into another town in and around Bar Nauzad, and there's going to be a huge helicopter assault of the, I mean, effectively, you're going to have two companies, so a battalion minus is going to go in this area, and they're going to, like, raid these villages and get in huge gunfights and kill the Taliban commanders. It's like a real disruption operation. Well, the way that that happens is you have to send in the reconnaissance marines first, and so they did that. We wanted 48 hours of observation prior to we were given 24 hours of observation if it was like one cycle of darkness. So here's how the whole thing went down is we've developed this huge mission. It's a big time mission that we're planning. And then it comes down to who's going to get the more dangerous mission, the one that is closer to Bar Now's that. Matt wants it because he was the one who discovered it initially. And I was like, no, that's our turn to go back out there. And so now him and I are like yelling at each other. We're arguing over whose team gets the juicier of the missions, the more dangerous of the two missions. Both of them were inherently dangerous, right? One of them was just closer to the enemy's rear area. And so what our platoon commander does, he's like, all right, this is what we do. We're going to flip a coin, right? So we have a pog uh, over there. So like the, you know, the, you know, whatever the, the PX that we used out there, the, you know, the little PX shops. So they had a pog. A week earlier, we were in uh, the COC and Matt was deciding to re-enlist or not. And he was like, well, what, you know, what do we want to do it? Bonus, yada, yada. And we're like, all right, well, we're going to flip a coin, right? And so we flipped the coin and it landed on heads and he re-enlisted right there. And so everything that we did was always back to a coin flip. And so it came to the coin flip where they said, okay, the rules are the same. Heads, AJ's team gets it. Tails, Matt's team gets it. Matt's team won. And he got the mission. And so we knew it. Everybody knew we were getting into a fight. We were armed to the teeth. He actually took an eight-man team. But I think we had plus a couple of more inside of there. And I had a huge team as well. The mission starts off like most of ours. It's the middle of the night. It's colder than hell because it's we're in the southern tip of the Hindu Kush, so it's like raining and sleeting, but not snowing, and it's like this terrible mix of everything. And so he has to go out first. So he's going out first to go with a helicopter insert. And what we asked the helicopters to do was do dummy drops because the, the, the Taliban knew that tree people fly in these helicopters. And so they're always very cognizant. So the idea is to do dummy drops, land three or four different times. And on one of those occasions, the team will get out. The unit didn't dummy drop. They landed unbeknownst to us and were like, hey, this is it. And then they didn't do any additional drops so that hone the Taliban in on a specific area or region of where Matt's team could be. This is all hindsight. We're figuring a lot of this out. My team's going in via vehicle. And so we're with the infantry Marines in their cat section, and we're driving up and we're going through the, the Hindu or the, the valley in between Nauzad, and my vehicle itself strikes an IED. And so how we're sitting is we're in an MRAP, right? And I'm sitting on the driver's side, and I have Two other members of my team, my radio operator, Tyler Johnson, and my point man, Nick Jacobs, both corporals, are sitting on the passenger side. My tire is the one that trips this IED, what was later estimated to be uh, uh, 80 pounds of homemade explosive. And so what happens is the, the thing trips and blows the crap out of the vehicle. It lifts us up in the air. Luckily, the vehicle was made by Oshkosh and has a V-shaped hull, which dissipates the blast so it doesn't hit a very hard surface. So it dissipates the blast, it shears the entire left side of the vehicle off, lifts us in the air, and then slams us back down. Knocks me unconscious, and so it rockets me, the bomb blows up underneath my butt, rockets me into the top of the vehicle. I knock myself out, Fall, you know, come like knock myself out. I come to, there's dust and smoke and crap everywhere. We got the two drive. I'm the senior guy in the vehicle. We got the two drivers, we got the gunner, and then my two guys. And I'm like, are you okay? Are you okay? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I pass out again, right? And I come to, and we're kind of sitting there. One of the Taliban's 
tactics that they used was they would use a very big IED for a vehicle, but then we know that there's first responders. And so they would use what we call toe poppers, smaller IEDs meant to maim, like blow feet off kind of thing for other first responders. And so we're kind of stuck. We know we hit the big one and now first responders are like, hey, do we need, do we need? And we're like, no, stay away, stay away. There's a huge protocol in trying to get to us. And then what happens is that the gunner's pretty messed up, right? And then all of a sudden what happens up front is an electrical fire starts. So we're waiting there like 10 or 15 minutes, stuck in this thing, like what's going on? We're waiting for an attack. Everyone's on high alert. Matt hears the explosion, right? He's valleys over, he's miles away, but he hears the explosion and he's trying to check in on me, right? And he's, everyone's kind of freaking out at what's going on. Well, then an electrical fire starts in the front of the vehicle, right? And it starts to move backwards. The driver, a driver hop out and they're like staying close to the vehicle for toe poppers. They get the gunner out of the vehicle. And then we see this thing start to be able to like move towards the rear of the vehicle. It's a 50 cal variant. So there's 50 cal machine gun, uh, ammo boxes kind of all over the place. Well, the recon team is wearing quarter ghillies. We're wearing ghillie suits, right? And ghillie suits are made of burlap, right? And rope, which are extremely, extremely flammable. So what we do is we start getting the vehicle. We start getting Nick Jacobs and uh, Tyler Johnson out of the vehicle. So we like shove the door open because it's kind of cattywampus because of the, the way that it was blown up. We get them out of the vehicle and then the vehicle shifts and I'm stuck inside. So now the door is effectively not sealed, but it's like super hard to open. And this fire is moving closer and it's starting to get towards the ammunition. The guys are banging on the door. I'm banging on the door, but I'm trapped inside as this fire is making the vehicle starting to become engulfed in flames. And I start making preparations to take my life because there's no way that I'm going to sit inside of this thing and burn to death. Unbeknownst to me, what happens is a man by the name of Corporal Chris O'Connor, who was in my team, who was about 200 meters away in another vehicle, leaves his weapon, grabs a fire extinguisher, and runs across a minefield where we know there are toe poppers, runs across this minefield as I'm preparing to kill myself. I'm preparing to like shoot myself in the head and just end it. He runs across and the whole team together rips this door open, squeezes this thing open for the first time in my life, being the runt of the litter, <laughs> being the small skinny guy played to my favor. Chris O'Connor reaches in, grabs me by my collar as the flames are coming up, yanks me out of the vehicle and then shoves a fire extinguisher into the vehicle and puts out the flames. And everything, we're kind of like, oh wow, we're kind of shaken up. Because we were attached to 3rd Battalion, 4th Marines, the call came down about an hour later when we got another vehicle ready to go that was gonna take us back, reinsert, keep pushing. I protest, my team is blown up, right? I, I'm concussed, we're vomiting, I can't see straight. And the, and the call is to push. The operations officer and I had a little argument over the radio and we followed the orders. So now my team is wandering through the desert, right? Using the North Star, trying to be able to kind of navigate. Nick, uh, myself, and Tyler are like, we're, we're the lead three in the, in, the, in the column, are vomiting everywhere. We can't see straight, it's just awful. I have a SARC, a Special Amphibious Reconnaissance Corpsman, Toshi Conan, in my team but he can't render aid. He can't give me anything. I'm severely concussed, just like the other two members. And so we have to patrol for the next eight hours in through the Hindu Kush mountains to get to a location where we were supposed to provide pre-raid reconnaissance for the team or for the infantry unit flying in. So we get into location right before sunrise, right? And the raid is supposed to happen late that afternoon. So I'm not getting good reconnaissance. And Toshi, the doc, won't let me go to sleep because I'm concussed, right? He doesn't want me to, like, I get it, right? I'm mad at him, but I get it. So we're up, we're cruising. Matt and I are able to be close enough that with a specific frequency, we were able to check in on one another. And we did this regularly. So we had a very close relationship with three, four snipers. We were the only people out. The offensive capabilities, like I talked about before, the only offensive capabilities that we had were the reconnaissance and the snipers. And so, you know, they'd be on one mountain range, we'd be on the, on the other in the middle of the night, we'd check in, hey, what's up guys? How you, you know, like somebody else sharing that misery. Matt and I checked in with one another that night. Hey, are you good? Yeah, we're good. We're, we're you know, good to go. At about 9 a.m. 
that morning, I hear all hell break loose from very, very far away. So about Matt's team's position was probably seven kilometers as the crow flies. So direct line from, from one another. And we hear a machine gun ripping. You can tell the difference between an RPK or a PKM and an M240. Our cycle of operations is much faster. So ours is a brrr or there's a pop, pop, right? So you can hear that. So we hear 240s, we hear rockets, we hear things blowing up, and I'm hearing scrambling over the radio. So I'll play the tape backwards a little bit. I'm listening to Matt, because I'm awake, I can't sleep. I'm listening to Matt, who was a, a JTAC. He was a joint terminal air controller, right? So he was able to call in birds. He says, I'm declaring an imminent tick. So a tick is a troops in contact. And when you declare a tick, that means you source all available resources in the region to your area to help break the contact. Based off of indications and warnings, Matt is seeing children probe his lines. So Afghanistan's very, very hard to hide in, right? Specifically in the, in the Hindu Kush mountain range, it's very hard to conceal yourself. And so the gig was up pretty early on where he was at. What the Taliban did was they started early that morning sending children out in pairs of two to like look behind rocks and kind of see where he could see and where he couldn't. And they were moving around and probing his lines. They're trying to find his dead space. And he identified this. And what he did was he's like, then he starts seeing men two by two move into an area unarmed. So they're finding our rules of engagement and working within them because there's a very fine line that we have to walk. And he says, something's not right. I'm declaring an, an imminent tick, which means service now, right? It's an, like, I guess it would be technically a priority. I think it was the term at the time, like a priority. It means service now. Since we were attached to the unit, they saw that, didn't agree with his assessment and changed it to a, from urgent to a priority, which means service within one hour. Well, what had happened was the Taliban are a smart uh, organization. We had Harriers and we had Cobras who were in and out on station running routine patrols. They timed the attack on Matt's position when both of those sections had to check off and go get gas. So they left, the reconnaissance team no longer had air coverage, the JTAC couldn't bring people in, and he had the priority or the urgent tick was downgraded to a priority tick, so we didn't have any other assets coming. And at around 9 a.m., 9, 10 a.m., the Taliban attacked with what we estimate to be 40 to 50 Taliban fighters. It was an eight-man reconnaissance team split into two positions that were 500 meters apart, mutually supporting, because you, it's hard to hide eight men in a mountain, right? So you have to mutually support. And about 40 fighters came up on Matt's position himself. And we heard this thing, all hell break loose. And I hear Matt on the radio, and I hear him over the TAD net, right, which is our air aviation network, trying to call for help, trying to get people uh, to him. And which eventually, now that a tick is established, they're sourcing people. They're racing back. Both the Cobras and the Harriers are racing back to get to be able to help Matt's team out. Because we have this, Afghanistan was different than Iraq. We had this really, really good relationship with a lot of our units that, we, that we're supporting. Scarface was the uh, aviate, was the Cobras and Hueys, and I think it was Wrath was the Harrier unit. We talked to them regularly, so we knew them. And so they were trying to get to our team that was in trouble. And I listened to Matt go through this process. And then I didn't hear his voice anymore. And the next voice that I heard come over the radio was Captain Kevin Kincaid, was the platoon commander who was on that mission. The platoon sergeant was with me. Kevin Kincaid was, the platoon commander was with that team. We had the whole platoon out. And I hear Kevin's voice come over the radio. And I know immediately, I know immediately um, that Matt was gone. So what had happened was the Taliban fighters had come up on the four-man team or five-man team and really just enveloped them and overpowered them. And immediately three team members were, were killed very, 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 very early on. 
And then what happened was that was going on. We had a sniper team to the north who was doing everything they could from 3-4 to leave their position to come and help the recon teams. Both them and the cat platoons disobeyed orders to ensure that they came to the rescue of that recon team. Because we were an attachment, sometimes we don't get treated with the same level of, of brotherhood that another unit does. But the Marines of 3-4 CAT and 3-4 Sniper Platoons disobeyed the operations officer's orders and said, no, we're going to get there to help break the contact, to send all people to get into that region. Well, then what happened was we were able to intercept communications that said, we got the first team, now we're going to get the second team. And now I started to see men two by two move into position directly below my position. And so I could see them moving in, but I didn't see any weapons. And technically because of the rules of engagement, because I didn't have positive ID, no matter what the inference was, if I killed those men, I would potentially be you know, in, a, in a tough spot. So we had the infantry, you now the infantry's landing, the raid is happening, everything is like, there's two huge helo assaults happening. And so we use the infantry as cover to be able to break our position and we line up with the infantry. And then we fight with them for the remainder of the day. And then we have to make a huge movement about 12 kilometers over to Bar Nauzad, where the infantry is now collapsed down with the main effort over in Bar Nauzad. Matt's team, the remainder of their team is completely evac at this point but we don't know who was dead. What we initially heard was that there was one MIA and two KIA, and we didn't know who. My heart told me I already knew. And so we spent the next afternoon, like that afternoon, fighting and patrolling with the unit back to the, the location, and we get in well after midnight. And the first thing I do with my assistant team leader and my platoon sergeant is I go over to the radio and I call up to the battalion headquarters and I tell them who I am and I ask them. So all Marines have, we have you know, line numbers or zap numbers, we call them, um, so that I don't have to give out any pertinent information. And I asked for the numbers of the KIA that we had. They read the numbers to us and Matt's was very easy for me to uh, understand. He had always been, he was an infantryman through and through. Some people are born for this. His line number was first initial of his last name and his last four of his social security number. And his zap number is India 0311. And I remember them reading that, that Matt Ingham, Jamie Lowe, and Nicholas Luzinski were the numbers that they had given us. And my entire team is now standing in a courtyard, middle of the night, while Joe Galuli, my assistant team leader, Efrain Martinez, my platoon sergeant, and I, the leadership, go and find out. And they're waiting to find out which one of their brothers are dead. And I have to deliver the news. So I walk back to the team, and they're standing there. And I read them the names. And I have to tell them that their brothers are gone. It's very similar to the movie 300, where one of the generals sons dies in battle. One of the things that we used to do as an attachment to a unit or as a good reconnaissance Marine is we made sure that the infantry Marines knew that they, that we weren't better than them, that everything that we did was about them, right? And so we would always stand watch with them. The worst watch, we were, we were never better than that. We always wanted to be with them. Just like in the movie, our Marines wailed in this circle. We're standing there smoking cigarettes, whatever it is. All discipline is kind of gone. We're in a compound. The infantry Marines wouldn't come near us. Every once in a while, one would come over and shake our hand or offer their condolences. But the eight of us would stand there, stood there and sobbed. And then I remember moving into a small little hut, um, kind of a mud hut that we were in. And our platoon laid there. They gave us the night off. <laughs> and they said that we'll take watch tonight. And so I remember our entire team, me being the team leader, we had an M4 standing up against a wall with its light on. And we had the light pointing at the ceiling. 
and all of us laid down next to each other. We sat first and we shared. We had some. We had a couple M and M's and some crackers left over, not much. And we all passed around this these packet of M and M's. We each got two M and M's. We all got you know a quarter portion of a cracker. And then we laid down and we told stories of one another. And Matt, and Nick, and Jamie. None of us wanted to fall asleep. I remember that we just laid there until the battery started to dim on the bat on the light and then eventually until the light faded. And that was it. That was how we mourned uh, the loss of that team. And the next morning, we got up and we continued the fight. We continued to press with the unit. We fought with them for three more days until we got to go back to Fob Cafaretta um, and, um, and see the rest of the platoon. And what I remember about Matt was that he was better than me. People talk a lot about guilt. I never have guilt over the things that I've done. I maintained a pretty good moral north as a sniper and an infantry marine as a reconnaissance marine. I, I made sure that my kills were clean. It's the things that I didn't do, the things that were out of my control, that I... I have to, that I lose sleep over. I wish I'd won that coin toss because he had a wife. He had a life ahead of him. Jamie was a young kid who played Guitar Hero and I'd go in his barracks room and hang out with him, you know. Nick Uzinski was a, he wasn't 20, he had never had a beer. He was under 21, right, you know just a good young American kids and their lives were cut short. And I just felt guilt from the fact that I couldn't trade places with them. And that Matt's team was fundamentally better than mine. And I, Matt was better than me. And I, and I, and I think that every day that I recognize that I believe that the wrong person died that day and I miss him. And so what I've done over years of working with counselors and working with people that really, really matter is I've found my passion is to tell his story. What I've un come to understand is that, I think it's an old Eskimo tradition, is that they said that the dead are never really gone until you stop talking about them, until their memory fades of them. So I talk about him and I talk about Nick and I talk about Jamie because I understood that Matt gave his last breath to save his team members. He was awarded the Bronze Star posthumously and the Purple Heart posthumously because he fought until the very, very end to make sure that his team got out okay. And so if Matt was willing to sacrifice his life for the potential survival of his teammates, who would I be to do anything less so from that time frame, I have dedicated my life to giving everything I can to make other Marines, other individuals, other men and women realize their own potential. The same gifts that were given to me as a young Marine who didn't believe in himself, who didn't think anything could ever, he could ever amount to anything. My passion in life now is understanding that if there's a selfless sacrifice, that Matt Ingham can do for his Marines, who would I be to do anything less? And so that's compelled me for the rest of my career. After Afghanistan uh, in 2010, I ended up moving over to Second Force Recon Company, spent three years out in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, and then moved over to a reconnaissance training company in Camp Pendleton, where I worked with the recon team leaders course. So I learned a lot along the way, specifically on education, education and special operations, I and mean, how to be able to do adult learning theory. And so in 2017, I was afforded the opportunity. I was selected as a Marine gunner. So I transitioned from enlisted to officer and became a chief warrant officer and a Marine gunner. And so part of that became a lot of education, a lot of training, a lot of mentorship. And so when I moved back to School of Infantry for my kind of twilight uh, tour. 
Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Berger, released his Commandant's Planning Guidance, and there was kind of murmurs about that. And what he wanted to do was he wanted to have something called Force Design 2030, of which looked at how were we going to man, train, and equip uh, our service and what we were going to look like uh, in, in 2030 in a future conflict. Part of that is what the Commandant mentioned in one sentence and one page in this entire 40-page document. He said, we need to revamp our educational model, specifically talking about enlisted educational model. And that was enough for us to kind of go off to the races. So I had worked with a group of people at the School of Infantry at Infantry Training Battalion for a number of months uh, where we tried to create an opportunity to take a new approach to an old problem. How would we better educate and train the young enlisted Marines of today for a future fight tomorrow? So we had to re recognize that the only thing that we felt we needed to change was everything. So we took a clean slate and we walked everything off and said, okay, let's work this system backwards. Force Design 2030, a, a, a probable fight looks like X. We used three major defining documents to figure out what this problem set looked like. Commandant's planning guidance, right? Force Design 2030 and the National Defense Strategy, the unclassified and classified version to talk about what we thought this person would have to uh, see in 2030. And we started building that plan backwards. The worst case scenario, how do I get this Marine through years of training to be able to solve that problem? What we found was that the current, well, the, at the time, the current Marine Corps ideology was to teach a Marine to solve a specific problem. Well, that works when you're trying to disassemble and assemble a machine gun, right? Solve that problem. But what that doesn't do, and what you and I grew up with was the service, was that doesn't create problem solvers. If I teach a Marine to solve a problem, the only thing he or she knows how to do is to solve that specific equation itself. But what happens if I change a variable inside of that equation? He or she doesn't know how to be able to solve something that is new. We wanted to be able to come out and say, how are we going to create problem solvers? That was more difficult than what we imagined because our entire training philosophy was built off of a model to teach a Marine to do a tactile task and that alone. So one of the things that I was benefited was I have been able to go through all of the officer education and all of the enlisted education. And there's a difference. Officers are educated, enlisted are trained. So think about it in this context. An enlisted Marine is taught how to disassemble and assemble a, a 240 Bravo in two minutes or 30 seconds or less. The officer is taught how to disassemble and assemble a 240 Bravo in two, in two minutes and 30 seconds or less and taught employment fundamentals about that from his or her infancy as an officer. Those employment fundamentals don't come along to much later as an enlisted Marine. So I'll give you another example. Marine Corps Doctrinal Publication 1, Warfighting, the, the effective governing document on how we make and wage war as a Marine Corps, our ideology, our Bible, if you will, is taught to Marine officers on day one for being an officer. That is something that they get handed and that becomes their doctrine. I was not introduced to Marine Corps Doctrine Publication 1 until I was an E7 with 14 years in. So when you're trying to be able to compare two things together, the enlisted never really stood a chance to have a collective conversation with an officer. Here's the common denominator in the process that we saw with the problem that we would see in a future fight. You must be faster, you must be more capable, and you must bring to bear more arms in what we consider a decentralized environment. So what we looked at was the idea is saying that a lieutenant of tomorrow must be as capable as a captain of today. Understandably thinking that a private or a lance corporal of tomorrow has to be as capable and free thinking as a sergeant of today. So the only way to do that is to fundamentally change the way in which we educate. And so we turned a product called adult education theory, right? And so from constraints-led learning to problems-based learning, how these kind of things worked. Here's how the SOI or School of Infantry instructors used to do it. They would say, here's your ammunition, 
complete this specific task, shoot eight to the chest and five to the head or whatever the cause was. And we would do that thing, rote memorization, do this thing on command, make sure that you're good at that thing because when you need to do it, you need to do two to the chest, one to the head, whatever the thing is. What we started to do now was change the pathology to say the combat instructors, the educators are effectively bumpers in a bowling alley. So what they do is we present the student with a problem. I need you to put 10 shots on this target in this amount of time. You get to choose how to do it. So the idea is to have them make multiple small level decisions over and over and over again. So by the time that they're done with us over this duration, they've made thousands of tiny little decisions. Because what we want them to do is become little decision makers. Remember back to my story in Op Operation Iraqi Freedom One when I got my first combat action ribbon was I was so afraid to solve the problem myself or ask for help that I chose to simply hope it away by closing my ejection port cover. Now what we've created through this educational system is saying that these young Marines have the opportunity to become inquisitive. They're simply allowed to be their own personality. I spent an entire lifetime as a millennial being vilified for everything. Everyone gets a trophy. You guys are snowflakes. You guys are weak. Yada, yada, yada. Well, guess what? My generation spent 20 years of war, right, to be able to make sure that it was our turn. So I'm tired of people telling me how bad of a generation I am, right? Well, what if we turned the map around and said, now as millennials, it is our job to make the next generation better than us? rather than to tell them how bad they are or how less good they are compared to us. So it becomes a social contract. We had to work on the sergeants, we had to work on the staff sergeants, changing the model to say, sergeant, you work for the private. Your sole level of existence is to ensure that that private is better than you. And if you do that to him or her, and then they come back as a sergeant, and then they in turn do that to the next generation, we stop vilifying the generations that come behind us on something that they can't actually control. We turn it around and make them better. We consider this a social contract. And what this happens is our previous model of education or culture inside of the Marine Corps was always negatively based, carrot versus stick you know that the Marine Corps, always, there are 1,700 different ways to NJP or punish a Marine. And there's like six ways to award a Marine, two of which they ever get, right? And so our entire model is built off of stick and not carrot. So we've turned the model around and said, okay, the, the Generation Z Marines, right, and the now Generation A Marines, they're motivated differently than we are. That doesn't make them bad, right? Here's the fundamental thing that separates a Gen Z from a millennial. It's one word. The word is why. And the word isn't because they're questioning what you're doing or questioning your authority. They're simply curious. They've grown up with a model of being able to have supercomputers at the tip of their hand or tip of their fingers. And so they're always like, hey, I will research that. So now what we do is we incentivize them to find out more. And we, all we do is pique their interest in a lesson plan and then let them figure out the rest. And so now what we've done is we've created this bias for action. And it's promulgating throughout the ranks. The social contract is changing. I used to get beat up or put in a sleeping bag or haze or whatever it is because that was the way that you were indoctrinated into a new unit. Well, now what they do is we have these Marines train harder, train faster, and train better than anything else that's comparable in the fleet. And so they show up, and the first thing that they get ta taught is that a new social contract has developed between their new fire team leader and them, and that their new fire team leader has to put them at the center of their existence. I learned this from reconnaissance, is the idea is that a reconnaissance Marine and a reconnaissance unit has never won a war. Who wins wars is the infantry. So while reconnaissance Marines have specialized training that help them with certain facets of their job, the fundamental purpose of everything comes back to the infantry Marine. So the reconnaissance Marine's job is to eat, sleep, and potentially die for the infantry Marine. We're changing of the social contract. 
our society really likes the idea of specialization and, and the hyper, you know, focus on special operations. But remember, special operations never won a war, right? It's the ground pounders, it's the conventional forces that do that. So telling these infantry Marines that they are in fact valuable, of which they are, now rising tides raise all ships. So we've created this effective army of these Marines that aren't afraid to make decisions, that aren't afraid to ask questions, and now create a culture of understanding between the ranks themselves. I've heard every model under the sun. People have said, oh, this is a softer, gentler Marine Corps. And I was like, listen, homie, my retort to that, it was, I was like, I was both a sniper instructor and a recon instructor, right? I will guarantee it that these Marines are getting theirs. We have doubled the length of the training. We have made it harder than it ever has been before. What we made infantry training today to be as hard as sniper training as it used to be and recon training as it used to be. I made sure that the course that I helped develop in Camp Pendleton was harder than any course that I went through as a sniper or a reconnaissance Marine. The difference was I didn't treat the Marines like shit going through it. I established what the requirements were, I helped them along the way, and then our instructors were the bumpers to help the Marines figure out their own path to success. It's just like teaching someone to ride a bike. We are the training wheels until we take the training wheels off. This has been the highlight of my career and the bane of my existence, right? We created cultural change inside of the service. How do you tell a service that is, we didn't promise you a rose garden, or the only easy day was yesterday, or shut your mouth or get one in the summit? How do we change that culture without losing the identity of what it means to be a Marine? And I fought everybody, everybody under the sun. You guys are making them soft, whatever the thing is. We fought them all, but guess what? By every single measurable metric, the Marines are stronger, faster, better shooters, more accurate and can go further distances than they ever have before. And all we did was remove the barriers. What we found through this process was the thing that was preventing the infantry Marines that you and I were from being as good as we could be was not our limitations. It was the limitations imposed upon us by our officers and staff and COs before. So the thing that was in the way of these young Marines becoming great themselves was our opinion of what they could be. So the idea is we took a quote from Van Gert, which is a Prussian philosopher, and he said, look at a Marine for what he is, and he only becomes worse. If you look at a man for what he could be, he becomes what he should be. We just took man out and put Marine in it. And so now it's the same thing as a bumblebee, right? A bumblebee doesn't know that aerodynamically the wing to lift ratio is not supposed to be able to fly. Nobody ever told him that, so he just does it, right? Nobody ever told these Marines that they were supposed to be shitty until they joined the Marine Corps, and then we told them how terrible they were. Well, what if we just stopped telling them that they were terrible and said, you're gonna be awesome, you're gonna earn it, you're gonna work along the way, and, and then they rise to the occasion. I made sure that they climbed the tallest mountain in Camp Pendleton, that what was the what was the distance from every other school that they had to go to? I made it one mile longer. How much are they supposed to swim? Much more like add the levels and layers to ensure that everything that they do is we just create these little monsters that came out to it. The fundamental philosophy behind that is I had no faith in myself when I joined the service. It was people along the way. It was the contracts between a man and another man or a Marine and another Marine who said, I see you, I understand you, I will make you better than me. The Gunny Jacksons, Blake Coles, right? The Eric Olsons, right? Those Marines took me under their wing and said, I challenge you and I'm gonna give you everything about me to make you better than I was. And so we just replicated that at a larger scale. We had to change the way we did a business. But now what it happens is this takes us into a model, the same thing that I talked about with Matt Ingham. This is our why. How do we honor the legacy of those who have gone before us, those who have sacrificed for us? By making the world a better place, by making the service a better place, by using lessons that we've learned with them, the, the, the things that we've gone through with them, to use those as lessons to make the next generation better. Gunny Jackson wasn't here, I wouldn't have gone to the sniper in dock. If Gunny Jackson wasn't here, I would have quit during the sniper in dock. If Gunny Jackson wasn't here, of which I didn't tell you, I wouldn't become a reconnaissance Marine. Because Gunny Jackson visited me as a sergeant when I was working at sniper school, and he said to me, I said, ah, oh, I'm thinking about this recon thing, and he goes, peace shoot. 
I thought we covered this. He says, every man is in charge of their own destiny. If I come back here in six months and you're not here, I'll know where you're at. <laughs> and full circle, when I was a team leader at Second Force Reconnaissance Company on the 24th Mew in 2012, and I check into the Mew with my Force Recon Platoon, and I'm walking down the hallway of a, of a building within the aviation combat element, and I look to the left, I see Sergeant Major Jackson is the ace Sergeant Major. Wow. And I deployed with him on his final deployment. So a fire has kind of been lit. The idea of community, the idea of camaraderie, the idea of collectivism, to me, has been burned into me by my service in, in the Marine Corps. I joined the Marine Corps because I believed our values as Americans were under attack. And I served and continued to serve in the Marine Corps because I felt compelled to continue to do so. My goals and aspirations upon retirement is to continue that same trajectory. I look to continue to serve our United States and our Republic as best as possible. And I look to do it in a, in a new realm. The idea of, of where I hope to go is continue this pathway through governance and hopefully elected leadership at some point. I don't use the stories as an opportunity to grandstand and say, you know, this is why I should be successful. I use these stories to show that an idea of saying a scrawny kid from Northern California who didn't have much of an opportunity at success inside of a service was helped because people showed empathy, compassion, and love. Truly, that's what that was. And so when given that opportunity, I feel compelled to return that upon the same community that I received that from. And so now the opportunity to say, turn it around and say, how best can we continue to serve our nation? Right now, unfortunately, what I see is I see a national rhetoric. I see a vitriol. I see negativity and hate and venom, regardless of political ideology. I see the very values that I fought for the very values that hundreds and thousands of Marines, sailors, and American service members have died for, I see the same things being ripped away right now. And I'm compelled, just like I was on September 11th, I'm compelled to continue to serve. It's Thank you for what you do. Giving voices to, to, to veterans is not only uplifting, it's also healing. And to the other veterans uh, out there, thank you for the opportunity uh, to do this in, in any way that I can continue to help you. Uh, this has been an honor of a lifetime.